um, local studies and family history can be used without inheritance income. Uh, six months ago, uh, we were born into the fold of Paramount Library here in the Clive building. Um, so the library itself is on level one and two. And uh, for local studies, we have our own uh, research lab. And I'll be showing you all of that this afternoon. Um, so this building is very new. Um, the five itself stands for Paramount High. So, and also the word five is because the building is number five. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about that again uh, later. And so just some housekeeping. Um, the exits are here. Um, if in the unlikely event of an emergency, please follow staff to the fire stairs. Okay, the toilets are down to the right as well. Um, tea will be at 10.40, okay? And um, there's water in two fountains downstairs, but also around the corner. Now, if you need cold water, just grab me or Carol's around to be able to help you. That's Carol there. Okay, you'll be able to help you. Uh, there's water. Um, we have the lunch is um, self catering, so but we've got a lot of amazing food around here. So down at the front, if you came from the station, you would have walked through. There are restaurants and takeaway places all the way along here, um, serving lots of different things from Japanese and burgers, Thai and Italian. Also, if you go across and down as well to St John's Church, which is the oldest church in Australia, um, you can walk down Church Street, which is actually called um, Jeep Street as well. Oh, I can do myself. That's mm -hmm. nice. And um, so there's lots of places down there. So there's lots of amazing food and uh, lots of places to sit in and around the building. Um, also, we've got the pre-polling going on today. We've had it all week. And if you want to, at the end of the day, or if you've got time in the middle of the day, you can actually vote if you haven't voted already. I did it um, on Wednesday afternoon. It took literally like 10 minutes. So anybody from anywhere can vote in Paramount, okay? Um, yeah, so that's it for official. Um, if there's any questions about the building or anything like that, like housekeeping matters, Okay, so I'd just like to do a uh, welcome to country. Okay, so I begin today by acknowledging the Dharak people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather today. And I pay my respects to their elders past and present and emerging. And I extend this respect to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Thank you. Okay, enjoy the day. Um, I'll be around for most of the day. As I said, Carla will be here, Donna and Ellen will be here as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Emma. Um, and I just like to thank Emma and Ellen in front because they've done such a good job getting this meeting up and running. Um, thank you all for coming along and thank you all for booking on the bookings menu. It's really important that we keep doing that. Um, we've got quite a good lineup today. We tried to provide more time at the end of the day for general business and discussion with a focus on discussing things that come up on the local studies theories. But it should be a good day. So first up, we've got Bruce Carter, but unfortunately, Bruce had to go on a holiday to India. So we recorded his talk, <laughs> and then Jasmine and Tony from Lost in India follow. So it's usual thing, um, talk, for 30 minutes and then Q and A afterwards. The 10 slides in five minutes is definitely five minutes today. So I will be ringing a buzzer at four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's it. So enjoy the day and um, I hope you get a lot out of it. Oh, sorry. Doesn't speak for a couple of days. Oh, just a minute. I did I share the screen?
Hi folks, thanks for having me. I want to start by acknowledging that I'm recording this on the land of the Gadigal and the Wongal in the Aora Nation, recognising that this is unceded la Aboriginal land, it always was and always will be. And I pay my respects to First Nations people that may be joining us today. My name is Bruce Carter. It's lovely to be a part of this meeting. I spent a great 10 years working as local studies librarian at Leichhardt Library. Um, and much of my work in the last 12 years at State Library touches on local studies or community history. So I feel very much a part of the same sphere as all of you folks in public library local studies. In fact, I'm always telling researchers who come to us at State Library to make sure they check out local collections and don't pass them by as they could likely miss out. What I'll do today is touch briefly on some of the projects related to lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and queer community collections that I've been involved with in the last few years here at State Library. And for the most part, I'll refer to these as simply queer collections. It's hard to find current population level data around LGBT Q communities in Australia, and this limits our capacity to accurately estimate the number of people in, who might identify as part of the queer community. However, it's widely understood that people of diverse sexual orientation, sex or gender identity, as we know, account for about 11% of the Australian population, at least. However, being in the business of collections and collecting, it's probably just as useful to reflect on some words by artist Archie Barry, who spells out another of the fundamental problems faced by LGBTQ communities. Barry said, the ability to see yourself in the past is essential to forming a sense of belonging in the world. Predecessors confirm that you are not alone in history. I think this speaks directly to the importance of collecting work. And I think too, we're at a tipping point in our culture. The early 21st century has seen an emerging focus on queer lives across media and in general discussion and literature and art and film and everywhere. We've had the marriage equality bill passed. There's a wider acceptance that inclusion is important to aspire to. And I think many people now recognise that queer histories should be an ongoing part of the work done by collecting institutions, no matter how big or how small. Coming out in the 70s, big pink banner, 19, uh, 2020, 21. An exhibition called Coming Out in the 70s became the State Library's first major exhibition to focus on queer life. Set in the early years of gay activism in Australia, between 1970 and 1978, the exhibition greatly boosted awareness of the library's work in collecting documentary evidence of the LGBTQ experience in our state. But an exhibition like this remains a rare example of large institutions such as the State Library engaging with queer communities through exhibition. It's fair to say that with the occasional exception, there hasn't been a lot of effort made to make queer collections more visible and accessible to their communities so that people can see themselves in the historical record. So how did this exhibition happen? Well, in 2018, the library was offered the accumulated records of an activist called Alexander Watson, commonly known as Lex Watson. Lex was a foundation member in 1970 of the organisation Campaign Against Moral Persecution. And later with co-president Sue, a woman called Sue Wills, he was the organiser of the first gay rights demonstration in Australia in 1971, and a prominent face of gay activism in Sydney for many years thereafter. He was uh, central to the campaign to decriminalise sex between consenting males, which didn't happen, let's remember, until 1984. And Lex's papers had been meticulously listed, organised and presented to the library by Sydney-based historian and archivist Robert French, who for many years worked for the National Archives. Robert didn't just present the papers, he also proposed that the library mark the 50th anniversary of the start of gay activism in Australia with an exhibition. 
So working alongside my colleagues, Margot Riley and Camilla Roy Man, Ronald Briggs, who I'm sure many of you know, we spent quite a bit of the first lockdown in stack going through lots and lots of boxes, not just Lexus boxes, but also uh, collections that have been uh, acquired by the library in the 1980s and 90s related to 1970s and 80s activism. Ultimately, the exhibition focused on three themes, being seen, being heard and being together. And when we launched in 2020, there was a whole lot of interest. We were very fortunate that we had someone on our IT team at the library at the time who was very keen on online exhibitions. And we have a fantastic resource that's still there online, uh, the coming out in the 70s online component. Um, which is set, saw in its first 12 months up 139,000 visitors that accessed the exhibition online. But it was the most frequently visited story on the library's website throughout that first 12 months of 2021. So this got us thinking about what had been done in the past and what we needed to do now. Because as I said, the library had been open to collecting queer materials for a long time, for at least three decades. But what our work in coming out in the 70s brought home was that people generally were not aware of the, the, those collections and, or of the years of active collecting that was were driven by Mitchell Librarian Margie Byrne, who some of you uh, may remember or know, and those who worked with her. While the library had collected intensely in the 1980s and 1990s queer collections, it hadn't done a lot to let people know that the collections existed. So the first thing we did was get up this uh, online research guide, which is organised by format, um, which you can take a look at. Ellen uh, will be providing a, a links for you. Um, and as I said, the success of the exhibition amplified that we have many gaps and silences. We knew there was a lot of collection material unidentified as, as queer, and we also knew that we needed to get uh, that collecting had slipped and we needed staff had retired, taken jobs elsewhere and so forth. And we needed to get back to being a bit proactive about our collecting around queer communities. So the collection guide was the first start. Uh, we also put it out there on, a, on our website that we want, we're looking for material. We identified queer collections, the queer community as, as one particular community of interest. Um, and we began talking to a wonderful group of people that had got together with us when we started doing Coming Out in the 70s, a consultation group. And we expanded that group to make it broader in uh, age and, and, and background and, and identification um, to 20 people. Um, and the lived experiences and insights of this group have been really important to us as we continue to build our collections in preparation for, and uh, here are some examples of the sort of material that we started uh, locating and uh, adding to the collection, um, a lot of photographic material, um, a whole lot of new oral history work has been uh, done with queer communities in New South Wales, and this will be uh, 30 new interviews will go up through the Amplify tool uh, in June, so keep your eyes out for that. Um, and that's in recognition of the fact that our, our oral histories with, with, with queer communities, again, dated back to the 1980s and 1990s. And we didn't have really, what we really wanted was a contemporary snapshot of the communities today. So we've been talking to lots of people and doing some, some really wonderful oral histories. We took a more proactive look at our published collections to make sure that we were um, getting everything that's being produced, so much material being produced, as you know. Um, and we also especially made sure that a lot of this material uh, went into the SRL collection so that it could be loaned out through the public library network. Here's some examples of material we've collected, uh, a suite of photographs documenting the Parramatta Pride event that's been happening for the last few years.
and a great range of photographs, suite of photographs of the Rainbow on the Plains Festival in Hay and the Riverina. Which brings us to Pride Revolution today, February. Last month, we launched the second major exhibition the library's ever done around queer, queer life. Um, this is a much more contemporary exhibition. It's, it draws on historical material as well as uh, a lot of contemporary material. So a lot of the material that we've acquired in the last couple of years, as well as some commissions. Um, it's been hugely popular. We've had great response to it. A lot of people have talked about the emotional impact of the show. If you're in Sydney, uh, please come and have a look. Um, we'd love to know what you think. Uh, we are working on an online component to the exhibition, but that probably will not happen till after the show comes down, so after July. Um, so it's fair to say that the last three years or the last four years since we were first approached about doing coming out the coming out in the 70s show, there's been a major shift. We've been really getting really proactive about our collecting and about connecting and talking to people um, and seeing what we can do to build up our collections again around queer community. Here's another shot of the, the Pride Revolution show. Some of my lovely colleagues, not long after the show opened. And these last few years for me, I guess, have really brought home to me the fact that Libraries are not neutral spaces. When we do our jobs well, um, people are encouraged to reflect on their own experiences, but we've often failed to tell marginalised stories and to collect marginalised community stories. Um, we need to, if we want to be inclusive, that often means, and creative, that often means being creative and getting out of our comfort zone. And I know for lots of you, this is this is no news because you're out there doing this stuff, but these are just things that I've been reflecting on. Um, I guess nothing, uh, nothing really uh, great ever comes out of a comfort zone. Um, that's one thing that I'm very aware of. Um, so I've been talking to a lot of people um, and had to prove my worth. Um, in order to convince people that the library is a place where they should should lodge their collections and that we that we do take their 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 backgrounds and their lives seriously, um, it's all work. Uh, and as part of that, also our personal beliefs, I think, need to take a back seat when we're doing community work. Um, and we do need to think about what we're doing here if we're aiming to represent. The community, in whatever form, um, what we may think personally about some of these things should take a back seat. And as I said, be prepared to. to uh, we have to be prepared to prove our worth, and we also have to be prepared to be told to go away. Yeah. Pride Line. You've probably already heard about this. This is a great initiative um, as part of the Pride Revolution show. Uh, People can call from anywhere and we're getting a whole lot of calls to this line. People can leave a message of up to five minutes, their story of their life, um, their queer life. People can call from anywhere across the state, country, internationally. Um, and these recordings will become part of our oral history collection. I'll leave it at that. And um, you can contact me anytime through the uh, local studies email list if you ever want to talk about any of any of, of these issues or, or quick collecting or how to get started. I guess I'll just reflect too on um, when I was working at Leichhardt Council in local studies, I was aware of a women's community that existed in the area and I found that there was nothing in the collection. I thought, what can I do about that? So I kept talking to people, again, proved my worth. And uh, finally, I found some women, uh, well, one woman in particular who was part of that community who was happy to do some oral history interviews for the collection. And we trained her to do in doing, uh, gave her a little bit of training in doing oral history and then the equipment and all that sort of thing. And off she went and out of that, we got six great uh, oral histories um, about uh, life for, for the women's community around the Leichhardt, Leichhardt inner west area. 
um, that have been part of the collection now for coming up to nearly 20 years. And I, I know that they've since been actually used in, in, uh, in a publication. So you just never know. Um, starting small, um, we never know where, the, where these things may end up. Okay, thanks for listening and uh, have a great day. The other thing, take them up on his offer. If you need information on how for advice or some direction, call me. He's great, he's a great source of information and he's happy to share. So next up, um Desmond and Kelly, and maybe you can have QA after. Screen, that's all. Just had to find which one I was screen sharing with. Now, there's a microphone here that you can hold and just swap there. Well, because there's two of us, we just stand next to it. Yeah, 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 sounds good. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just being really pathetic about my screen sharing today. Doesn't like the F5. Okay, what's up? Oh, no, 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 no. We've got to do the. Doesn't have the option. If you move this away, it's underneath this box. Okay. Okay, okay do you want to? Oh, yeah, yeah. So put your person here until it brings up that. We can press that down. Oh, yes, that's what we want. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some screen sharing. How do I get started? I know, right? Maybe. Oh, sorry. Cancel that. Sorry, it's it's just. Hi, we're information management tech <laughs> professionals. <laughs> okay, <laughs> duplicate spots. Sure. Okay. Oh, I still won't get rid of Oh, there's the minimize. There's the minimizing now. Yeah. And then we can. Move okay. That down. So can you put the code? Yeah, that's it. And it has the, yeah. It'll have to be there. Okay. Yeah. See, so here we go. All right. Anyway, hi, that's us. <laughs> um, hi, folks. My name is Yasmin. I hope you can hear me, and I hope you can hear me okay online. The mic is just there. Get a nod from the online person with the headphones. Is he listening online? Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, excellent. Sorry. Hi, my name is Yasmin Greenhouch. I'm a collection development librarian at Stanford Library. And this is Kelly Mitchell, who's the historical services curator. Um, we're from Stanton Library, which is the public library in North Sydney. Um, we would like to start by acknowledging that we're presenting this on unceded Darug land of the Baramashville people. Um, and the project that we're talking about today is um, a place-specific project on Camaragal land, just east down the river towards sea. Can you guys hear me okay at the back? All right, excellent. Um, so we pay our respects um, to all First Nations people here today and to your resilience, creativity and strength under continuing colonisation. Um, what we're talking about today, I believe that would work. Oh, that's us there. Oh, that's beautiful artwork that's up on our walls by Bibi Barber, Gringa Dreaming. So it's Camaragal land, but it was Gringa land. It, names change. Okay, Mapping Queen North Sydney is what we're here to talk about. So kind of following on from Bruce's talk, we're going to give you one of our um, ways which we've started to um, collect some um, queer stories from North Sydney. Um, so we're going to go through the need behind the project, other projects that inspired us, how we set up the technology and how we're trying to reach our target audience, um, of which telling you folks about it today is part of, um, and where we're hoping the project will go. Um, I suppose to start, I just wanted to start with a story from Camaragal Land, um, St. Leonard's Park in North Sydney to be exact. 
This is from Ali, um, and this is a story from around about oh, early 2000s. This is where I'd come when I was ditching class in my last years of high school. A few times I met a friend here from the other end of the train line. We walked here across, walked from here across the bridge and all through the city, talking the whole way. I was at the very, very beginning of coming out and struggling with everything. And 15 years later, on another long walk across the city, she came out to me too. So we're going to be telling a few of the stories from now, Matt, as we go through today. Um, but yeah, this is one of the many stories from the Mapping Queen or Sydney project. Kelly's going to take it from there. Okay, let's walk next to the mic, hey? <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks, Yasmin. Um, so researching queer history and local history collections, such as Stanton Libraries, and probably in a lot of yours as well, can be a challenging task. The library holds works of some LGBTIQA plus writers and artists, such as this beautiful acrylic Lunar Land by Kylie Hoy, that was one of the entries in the 2004 North Sydney Art Prize. And also here, this um, detail from the Heaven Mural that's on the wall of Stanton Library facing Civic Park and was completed, completed by artists Bronwyn Bassett, Jenny Pitty and Katie O'Connor. It was uh, North Sydney's centrepiece for the 1982 Women in Arts Festival. But um, the lived experiences of um, local queer people are much harder to find. Research sources are either tainted by bias or absent altogether. North Sydney may not generally be considered a particularly queer area, but in every community there's rich diversity to be found. So prompted by the momentum of Sydney Well Pride, we decided to embark on a project to help fill those gaps in the historic record by actively seeking stories from the queer community in North Sydney told in their own voice. And Mapping Queer North Sydney is the result. Um, an interactive online map project begun at the end of 2022 and launched during World Pride um, to collect queer stories in the North Sydney area. So LGBTIQA plus people and allies are invited to drop a mark pin on the online map to share a story, memory, life event or feeling, whether historical or current. Our aim was not only that queer people would feel heard by sharing their stories with us, but also that they could feel connected by reading stories which resonate with their own. We want to ensure that queer voices are amongst those documenting the history of our time and place so that members of the LGBTIQA plus community will find themselves reflected in our collections from now on. Um, now back to Yasmin again, who will describe some other projects that helped to inspire and inform our own. All right, so we found lots of different mapping projects um, around, and you probably know of 10 more than I've even seen um, coming from a different background in the local history. But the ones that really were useful in trying to work out what we're going to be doing with this um, project, firstly, querying the map. I don't know if many people here have seen it or heard of it. It's amazing. Um, it started... Uh, 10 years ago, I think I wrote down what year it started, 2017, sorry, um, in Montreal, um, created by Lucas La Rochelle. Um, it allows anyone to anonymously drop a pin and add a submission. And the whole idea of it is that you can, the quiz exists in the world. We're here in the world and it's that also that idea of you have memories attached to places. You go past a tree, you remember when you were a kid and you ran your bike into it, that sort of idea. So you're dropping pins and you're telling your story. And when you go through this map, there are pins all over the world. Some of them are heartbreaking. Some of them are touching. Some of them make you want to cry. Some of them are just silly and funny. Um, at the moment, there's a whole spate of them be pins being dropped in Antarctica where everyone's like, I'm a queer penguin. I'm a queer penguin too. So <laughs> that's been quite fun to watch. But it is really interesting. You can go in and you can drill into where your area is and see what stories are there. And we went in and attached, um, I went in and looked at all the stories in there and saw some absolutely um, lovely but also heartbreaking ones in North Sydney. And I was like, okay, there are, there are folks here. We've got to do something around that. The next one is the Mossman Memories, Memories of Your Street, to know more about that. I think that we can talk to Donna later. But that was fantastic because this is the adjoining council. We can see how people in our area might respond to something like that. Um, the third one we looked at was Small Town Queer. Um, this is from the Tweed Valley um, set. And this one has, as you can see in the 
slide there some fantastic pins that are little rainbow love hearts, which we loved, but we couldn't replicate. Um, that one's fantastic, that project, and that's very close to what we're hoping to do. They've also got podcasts. They've got a drag tour of the local museum. They've actually got a video of that up. They've done interviews and photos with people as well. So it's a bit more of a comprehensive project, or ours is just a specific mapping project. Um, that one was really interesting for me because that's where I grew up in Moorlumba. So, um, yeah, I can see they've got a few pins missing there that I have to go in and add. And then, of course, history pin. Um, I could go in and tell you a lot more about that, but I think that I'm preaching to converted here. You probably know a lot more than me about it. But that was really fantastic. And looking at history pin, we had a moment where we thought, hey, we can just tell people to go in there and drop their pins. But we specifically wanted to collect the stories for our collection, hold those stories, and to use history pen, it will be much more useful for us to do our own project and then do a curated collection into history pen, much like, you know, State Library has done, Powerhouse Museum has done, et cetera. So that was where we were going with that. Um, yeah, so talking about, yeah, storing the information, hand back to Gary, for instance. I think I only had that one slide there. <laughs> Thank you. Next one. Here we go. Um, so, yeah, our chosen platform was Engagement HQ, um, an interactive online map that was already in use by North City Council to engage with the community and to seek input on various council and community projects. Um, we recognised the potential to use the existing software in a new way for place-based storytelling and contemporary collecting outside of our usual local history offer. So that's sort of the homepage, and um, that's this is the back end of it, how it looks when we're um, managing it there. So thinking briefly about the, the pros and cons of Engagement HQ compared to the other platforms or online mapping projects that Yasmin just mentioned. Um, so pros, obviously, as I said, it's existing council software. So that meant we already had um, integrated functionality with our website, as well as ongoing IT support, both internally and from the service provider buying the table. We found it to be uh, pretty user friendly at the back end and, and through the public interface as well. And the reporting, privacy, um, data collection, storage criteria, all those sort of important factors for us in planning the project were already known and tested by council staff. Um, but as to the, the cons, um, anonymity was important to us to encourage freedom of expression. So we disabled the requirement for account registration and users instead create an anonymous screen name but uh, they still need to give an email address. Um, although the email addresses are obviously not publicly visible, we are aware that this step could potentially pose a barrier for some people. Um, another drawback is that the comments are moderated after going live um, rather than prior to posting, um, and also only by bang the table rather than by um, library or council staff. So we therefore decided to disable the functionality to upload photographs directly to the site. Um, in case of any inappropriate content. Um, and as an alternative, since we're keen still to collect photos and ephemera and so on, um, contributors receive an auto-generated email confirming their submission and advising them to contact me if they have any relevant material for the collection and to contact Yasmin in case of any other questions. Um, so I'll throw back over to Yasmin again now, talk about our target audience and how we're endeavoring to reach them. <laughs> Including you, of course. Yeah. So, um, target audience looks kind of straightforward, or maybe not straight, clear. Um, but we wanted to really make very clear that we were wanting stories from LGBTIQA plus folks and allies. Um, those are the people's stories that we really want to capture, and that it's place based with regards to the stories and memories. Do I have the story? Oh, no. Yeah. Um, so it's place place with regards to the stories and memories that we want to catch, but it's not necessarily about who can post. So we do need to get the word out as far and wide as we can. Um, so these were, yeah, those were con the considerations we had. Most people don't like being the first on an empty dance floor. Um, not me, I don't mind the space for dancing, but to start this map, I popped a couple of work ones on. So that's one of them. It's just a link through to things. And then I sent a, the moment that it was live, sent it through to lots of friends to say, look, you've, you've worked here, you've gone to school here, you've been in North Sydney. What have you done in North Sydney? Like you've been queer in North Sydney, pop something on. Um, 
And it was really delightful to read some of their stories. Um, and we slowly started to get memories and stories all put on the map. Um, as we went, we started to then, I, I started to see some stories, like the one that I read before from Ali, that's a friend of mine, because um, she went to school in the area. And then we started to see stories come through from people. I'm like, I don't know, might be someone I know, I'm not sure. And then we started to get the stories from people that I'm like, I have no idea who this person is. So the words started to get out and we started to fill up the map. This one here, um, first girl and girl kiss at the Rag and Famish, which is a pub down the road from the library. Um, she told me I kissed like a boy and I remember thinking that was even hotter than the kiss itself. And 20 years later and I'm a trans guy, so she was right. Don't know who Grotto is. I've got a short list of who it might be. <laughs> Not sure. So then more, more submissions started to come from further afield and the dance floor started to fill up. And it is still pretty sparse, but this will be a project that will go for a while. So, um, yeah, slow and steady is how we're hoping it will go. Um, so we started with marketing promotion. First, we started with the local community. We had all of the existing channels through the council for that. We have a huge number of high schools in the area, um, selective schools, private schools, and only like I think it's almost two in five live anywhere near by they all come from all over Sydney and you know essentially they're a captive audience really so we've sent it directly not just to the like the schools themselves but we've actually through established contacts sent them through to some students through the local youth centre um through the local youth hostel etc um so, yes, hoping to get the word out that way. And then as time goes by and we activate it a few more times, we're going to be sending it out through other channels. We've got a huge CBD, so one of the next stages will be sending it out through business networks, through all of their, you know, the pride networks of all the large corporates and things like that. So, um, yeah, that's kind of just been our outreach bit. Over to you. Over to you. Okay, so thinking about the, the future from here um just putting a another heartwarming quote there for you to enjoy what i'm talking um so in line with the the current contract for engagement hq we expect mapping queer north sydney to be running for up to four years the product will be reassessed council-wide in three years time and if a new community engagement platform is chosen then we will ex extract all this existing data for the local history collection but the map will be continually live until that time on North Sydney Council's website and community directory, um, but only um, promoted or activated, we might say, for further submissions twice a year. So during Pride Month in June and then Sydney Mardi Gras in February, March again. Um, and we intend to expand the call out in the future to actively seek contributions of photos, diaries, letters, posters, all that sort of ephemera um, to help future researchers build a picture of what it was and is like to be queer in North Sydney. Um, and we also see the potential to use the same platform to collect the stories of other communities currently underrepresented in our collections. For example, migrant communities, um, the diversity of North Sydney's community and workforce has really boomed in recent years, of course. Um, and now I think yeah, Yasmin just has some final thoughts to add before we let you go. <laughs> thanks, Kelly. Um, yeah, and thanks, folks, for listening to our project. Um, on the screens, our contact details. So please, at any time, just get in touch with us. Um, yeah, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to share what we've done so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. If you think that there's something that we could have done better, please also let us know. Um, you folks are just as expert as us in these things. Um, so I'd like to finish with one. I'll come back to that one last memory from my map. Actually, I'll leave that up. I'll just read this one. Um, it's one that makes me feel connected which is half the point of the project after all. There was a story dropped on Ball's Head Reserve. Um, my girlfriend's mum was yet to accept our relationship. I spent a few hours comforting her one late afternoon here after a particularly nasty fight they had. She felt us so alone and unloved. We watched the sunset together over the harbour. Then I took her to my grandparents' house, who she'd never met before, for a cup of tea and a cuddle. They treated her like she'd been family for years. I'll never forget this moment. To which I'll add thanks to them posting on this map, that this moment won't be forgotten at all and will live on in that form in our local history collection, which is the other half of the point of the project. And that's all. Thanks. Yeah. Questions? Oh, yeah. yeah.
that, is it optimised for use on a smartphone or is it better to look at on a, a it works on either. Yeah, yeah. So just um, head in. I'm probably sure I put a very large QR code on the screen so we can just get exactly with their phones. But, yes, it is there and it does work well on all platforms. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Next um, topic is Janelle. And oops, sorry. Oops. Oh, coordinated research and collection so it's different. Yeah. yeah. So um so yeah, the first presentation on the yeah. collections and, and, and yeah. how we got with and how we share. Share them with the broader community. Um, so, yes, yeah, so my name's Janelle Blucher. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to um, speak with you today. Um, and I just want to start by acknowledging that I'm on the lands of the uh, Baramadigal people of the Darug Nation and pay my respects to their elders past, present and, and future. So thank you for coming today and listening to me. So as coordinator of research and collections, so that, that means is um, I work for the city of Parramatta. And so my area, so maybe if I take us back a little bit um, prior to this wonderful building that we're meeting in today called Five, uh, which has this fantastic library and all these other sort of um, community and civic facilities. Um, I worked out of, I still do, out of the original um, visitor and, and heritage um, centre down in the bottom of Church Street there and Emma um, and Nira and the team were part of my team back then um, where the local studies library was, was, was situated down there. So with the reorganisation and, and the opening of this new, new space, the, we had a bit of an organisational redesign and that meant that the local studies um, a library and the team came into the public library space and sort of moved out of my, my area. Um, but we still worked um, very closely. <laughs> and, um, yeah, and so, so besides um, with, with the new change, so my area still remains as um, heritage archives, cultural collections. And um, in addition to that, I've also um, been very, very privileged to be involved in the development of the keeping place here in this so it's Aboriginal keeping place here in, in Clive. So that's at that's at um, establishment phase at the moment. So, so that's my areas of work. <clears throat> so I'll just give you um, an overview of the collections that we, we care for, um, starting with the Council Heritage Archives. So yes, so we can actually state that um, the Parramatta um, City Council Archives is probably one of the most complete municipal archives in New South Wales and has material dating back to 1844. So um, I'm not sure if you, I dare say you have been um, um, delved into archives yourselves as being um, local study librarians and worked with archivists. Um, so we've got a great collection. Uh, so there's sort of different, you know, so archival recordings of different properties. We've got files on, you know, parks and gardens around the, the LGA. Information on all the different council elections over the time, and from from health and to health and sanitation reports, and and then quirky um, documentation going back to early times where you had some really un unusual titles for different different people's professions, things like the inspector of nuisance and things like that. Um, and then the rate books and the building applications and valuation lists and things like that. So, so you know, even with the value valuation lists, some of the stories that can be brought, you know told from those from those listings. You know, um, you know, years ago when there was, you know, death duties and things like that, you know, people had um, the valuation list were called upon to determine, you know, how much was paid. And so then, but what it did is identified not just the property value, but also listed everything that was in the building, like all the furniture, so they got insight into what people were living like in that time. So that's just an example of, you know, how we can, can use the council archives. 
In addition, we've got the Community Heritage Archives. Um, so with the Council Archives, it says they've got 11,000 records, so that's just re recorded. And we've got, I think in every collection, there's legacy collections. So there's, there's a, a whole bunch of other material too, which we, we still need to, to work through to, to identify what, um, what we have. Um, it's an ongoing process. So yeah, Community Heritage Archives is a um, collection comprising records um, created or gathered by individuals and community groups that relate to the social history and development of the Parramatta LGA. So besides, you know, what we see on the screen, we've got um, memoirs, um, so di the different uh, recordings of people's life experiences. Um, so we've got, for an example, one, you know, handwritten essay from a, from a, a fellow a resident of Parramatta you know, back to the you know the eighteen eighties and talking about floods and and you know documenting and commenting on a poor Mister Knight who attempted to cross the bridge of the North Rocks Road, you know, driving a horse and spring cart and washed away. And so yes, there's, there's, once again, there's you know great stories, you know, buried in all this you know wonderful material that we have in our collections, and then the cultural collections. So that's you know the objects that we have. So so. Um, We've got, um, oops. So yeah, so basically this this is a, a broad collection that we, we so it says 100,000 objects. So you could probably um, assess that there's probably 70,000 of those objects are archeological material. So we probably have about 20 or so assemblages um, in our collection. So varying in sizes and significance and things like that. Um, and then we have, uh, like one of the little items that we have in the archaeological uh, collection, which is quite sweet, is a, um, a convict cup. So it's a small little cup, but it's probably one of the first made by convicts using the um, Sydney clay. Um, so that's in our collection. And, um, and then, of course, the different pipe, you know, coloured pipes and ceramics and um, metal objects and things like that. So... Um, yeah, so we have it for a number of collections from all different areas of, you know, Paramount's LGA. The most recent um, collection that we have is from PLR, uh, Paramount Light Rail so, um, area. And in the side of that, we're actually, when I mentioned the Keeping Place, um, we're in discussion at the moment with the Australian Museum to look at the archaeological material that they're holding that relates to this um, Parramatta area and looking at bringing it back onto country. So that's what we've got in discussion at the moment with um, our Doug um, elders. And uh, in addition to that, we've got our social history collection. So, um, yeah, some interesting little bits and pieces there from different um, businesses, early businesses in um, in Parramatta, like pies, chemists, you know, a you know, can of you know, fly and ant exterminator or there's some, you know, furniture polish or, um, you know, food items, not actual food items, but the containers. Um, and then, of course, um, stories, uh, objects that relate to the early market gardeners and so uh, telling stories of, of um, the different different peoples that came across the world to, to find, find their lives in Parramatta um, and developing their gardens. And so there's handmade and homemade um, garden implements and things like that. So there's um, so there's really small items right up to really large items. So we actually have some oversized items, like the, you know, a, a baker's cart that was used by um, pilchers, I think it was, like in 1924 to deliver the bread around Parramatta. So it's it's really is quite a, a significant and interesting collection that we're fortunately um, have the opportunity to care for. I just ask, where are you research? Okay, so the collection... At the moment, is housed still housed down at um, the old Heritage and Visitor Information Centre. So I still work out of that out of that building, even though it's closed to the public. Our collections are still uh, located down there. Um, if if anybody wants to access, like view an item in one of, of our collection or access the collection um, through our website, um, you can you can contact. One of our the archivist or cultural collections officer, who's we don't have anyone at the moment. She finished up with us a couple of weeks ago, um, but anyway, we're there and we can um, share our collection items with you. And if 
if it's you know, possible, we can actually bring it up here into five, saving having to go down there. Um, we've got a um, what's called a transit room here. So it's a, it, we can actually bring items here to, to show them all. If it's easy enough, we can we can meet you down there to, um, to share. And this next slide is uh, telling us all about the legislation and policy. So of course, with the, with the ownership um, or the care, the uh, being the caretakers of this collection of material, of course, we need to we have responsibilities that come with that. So of course, we're obligated to um, you know care for our collections and document them, and you know as per you know different legislation and policies. So of course, you you. Um, you know, the state record, you know, we all know probably that, you know, just recently, you know, the SARA and living, Sydney Living Museums have, you know, joined and, and now it's developed this Museum of History of Wales Act, um, and which is, which, is, which is fabulous, you know, combining of resources. Um, so it's with the State Records Act, um, we, you know, we need to sort of follow that as far as for accessibility and even how we house them and how we um, um, display, you know, describe them and assess them and all that sort of stuff. So, um, so just to 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 read off here. So the council archives collection contains, you know, archival records. So that the archival student archival record um, is classified classified as a state archive as set out under the state records um, act or deemed to have continual value to the city of Parramatta the community and the author government. So the Council Heritage Archives is for the retention of records that are deemed as um, having permanent value, value for the city. And once they're deemed by actually following the, the sentencing, what they call the sentencing process um, under that Act, um, which is, is when the archivist um, assesses the material to, to, to deem whether you know, it's to keep or dispose or to determine its value and its significance. Um, and then there's, I'm sure you're probably familiar with all these, these different legislation and things. So, um, so in addition to that, you've got, you know, the standards of record management. So it tells you about how to manage physical, physical storage of collections according to international standards. So even this archival material has a certain restrictions on, you know, where and how you, how you store it, um, not just about how you I've documented it and sentence it and care for it and, and that sort of thing. So um, in addition to that, as, you know, according to the, the applies to the cultural collections is your protection of movable cultural heritage act, um, which of course, you know, prevents any items being taken out of the country. Um, and then the heritage act is, you know, property in place. And, and then of course we had the different policies, um, council policies, um, that um, we need to abide by to to care for for all our collections. So um, so this one's talking about our inquire our services and our customers basically. So um, what we do is we provide access. You know, besides caring for these collections, we're providing access to the, to the different to the archives and cultural collections. So, in doing that, um, we work across teams in council, um, and this other for different you know civic events or different cultural events and things like that. I just can't. Oh, if I can come down here, there's something covering the link but anyway um so for an example of a support that we we work across council teams for a civic event is um and external of course um is a you know an event around hmas Parramatta. um so what we do is we delve into the collections and into the archives and of course you know um liaise with the external sort of stakeholders and and put together a, a story and and share images and and things um and document that event and present it on our website which emma has done a lot of work on and that's this one's from natalie and then we also come down we have these wonderful little sort of images of items that are our collection so that's just another way of us sharing sharing out um, collection material um, be it the documents or the, all the objects and um, 
and then putting it online to to recognise the event. Um, like that, that, that our civic and, and civic team would be, you know, coordinating. Um, so our customers, um, you know, basically, as a, as a, that's an example of an internal customer. So it's a, sort of like council, um, different council teams, but also external customers, obviously, like the different stakeholders and, you know, and, and all the people that come to you for, for um, as, you know, in your, your profession, you know, there's, people, there's the academics and there's people, you know, local historians and people of personal interest in, in um and other institutions, like liaising other institutions and things like that as well. Um, so we still work with the local studies library team um, here, like with Emma and the team, um, to um, support any uh, events or any uh, anniversaries or any other sort of programming items. Um, we work with the programming team that's in five. Um, to um, su support them in what they what they deliver. And um, yeah, so and then also, I'm just looking to see if I'm missing anything from my yeah. And that's just sort of saying here. So yeah, we use the, use the items for um, to develop the 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 research articles and things that we put online. Um, heritage interpretation. So that's that's um, as a as a requirement under the. The developing applications is generally the, the heritage in terms that needs to be put in place. Um, so uh, my team support um, the heritage and interpretation team. So, so you'll see on level one and level two, like the entrances into the library there, there's those displays. So that was part of heritage in terms. So they work um, closely with well, with local studies team for the for the for the for the research and information and my team for the for the collection objects. Um, to implement that, and also if you know if you see interests throughout Permanent Square, um, and and so forth. So that's where we support that as well. I've got their Gipper inquiries. Um, so so that's um, our council archivist. Um, as I said before, contains the archives contain primary records that tell the story of our organisation and reflect the experiences of the community residing in Parramatta. Um, and so records in our council archives are com commonly requested by members of the public for topics such as family and house histories and things like that, but they also are required for um, rights and entitlements purposes. Um, so access to the collection is regularly requested by the council's Gipper team um, so that they can respond to freedom of information inquiries. Um, so, and then sometimes our records are subpoenaed. Um, for legal matters, so um, it's quite important that um, a, a, a role of the heritage archivist is to support the Gipper inquiries to come in. It's my cursor them. So the stories through our collection. So this is just one way of um, showing, um, as I said, I'll refer this is our Paramount History and Heritage website, um, which. If you just put in Paramount History and Heritage, I think it comes up the top of the, the Google search. Um, so there's lots of um, fantastic information on that site and it's been developed over many, many years. Um, so you've got um, topics there which show you all the research material, which is, uh, you know, um, the great work that the local studies team have done over the years. Um, and then adding to that, we're sort of throwing, uh, putting in different, different um information relating to more search of the collections as well. But if there's, once again, this is just showing an example of um, working with the um, civic team to recognise 160 years of Parramatta. Um, so this was one of the works of, uh, of uh, Paige Davis, who's our heritage archivist. Um, she delved into the, to the archives to find out um, and to, to tell the story of the history of the, of, um, of Paramount Council. Um, so um, and and so in this in this um, collection, so this just shows you what the page looks like. And there's just got different stories here. And so we can actually break it down here and show some of the items that we've had. And that's that image there, the Paramount Market. So that's um, the first entry in the minute book, dated 30th of July. 1946, so that's in our collection. So there's all this wonderful stuff. And then um, 
once again, if it go right down. Um, yeah, there's lots of links in there as well. And then you'll see this little image I've got over the side here. Um, that's just showing that we've got a great collection of um, images in our collection um, and they're accessible through, through that website. We see on the screen there, it says a search the archives and collections. That is our, um, our database browser. Still in work in progress I and mean, it's not perfect, but there's some great stuff there um, that you can, can search in there. And that image showing the, the coloured squares and the, the, the cars outside the, the um, council library is um, it's just an, an example of one of the images that it, that's there. And then another way we had, um, uh, we uh, walked through to just share the stories of the collection is a, a, a video series called Welcome to A to Z, The Things at Parramatta, and that was presented by a cultural collections officer. Um, so these are just some of the images I've pulled out that were presented um, through that A to Z and, and how some one object in the collection might link to you know, another, another part of the collection. Um, so, so that this is actually this up here is um, a part of a ceiling. So there was um, a, a fellow named Faust whose family migrated to Australia um, and um, they lived in, in the 1870s and they lived in Parramatta. And um, so the, the item that features in the video um, is a diary of Augustus Faust, which tells us the story of the journey to, to Australia. And then the other item we have is from the, the son, um, who was a, an artist and muralist. So he put these murals on the ceilings of their home here. So, and we have one of the murals in our, in our collection. Um, this, this wall winder, I think this little object here is quite an interesting um, object that we have. So, of course, in the early days, you know, the, when, you know, the walls came in, you know, great big things like that, and you, you know, have to use your hands and to bring them down to a small, smaller skein so people could use them for knitting. So this was a little invention by um, a, a, a pattern make a, a, a Clyde and um, so it was made of um, perspex from the aircraft that they were building at that point in time um, and then scraps of cedar was used as well. So, um, yeah, it was a great boon to um, the, the, the women who were uh, here at the time that were all busy knitting socks and that for, to, for the soldiers um, and this was donated by a, a lady at the time who was 76 and she recalls her mother using that to, um, to um, as, a, as a wool winder back then. There's this great game that was developed about the Parramatta, so it sort of takes you all around Parramatta. Um, and this other object down the bottom is another, um, to, it's a pro heart, so that was a, on, a, on a, it's recognising the Parramatta Fair, so it was a centenary of that, that, that put, put on the plate, but we do have the original painting as well. And um, yeah, another object from one of the, the businesses in Parramatta here from years ago. Um, and another um, opportunity that we had last year was when this building opened um, in that space. I'm sure if you've been downstairs to see where the Lego exhibition is, um, we had the um, opportunity to, to present the first exhibition. Um, so there was a lot of blood, sweat and tears went into that. <laughs> Emma did the um, the online stories because you know instead of having an exhibition catalog, um, we didn't do that printed copy thing. So so basically the cat exhibition catalog was um, Emma's work that um, she she pulled together and put on to our Paramount History and Heritage page. Um, so yeah, it was called Green Thumbs Blue Ribbons, and it was recognising um, two hundred years of anniversary of the Royal Agricultural Society. Uh, so the first um, fair was held here in Parramatta, so hence the connection. Um, but it told, we didn't just sort of centralise it on that, we expanded the story to begin with talking about agriculture and land use um, across time and the intersections of people with the land. So it began, of course, um, stories with Darug here, the biomedical people here, 
on the lands here, sort of told that stories, of, you know, and how the yam daisies were their, you know, were their main um, food source that, um, that they were planting here. And, um, and then it took, took you right through to, once again, to the, the Royal Agricultural Show, the development of, you know, the past of sheep, you know, wool. And, um, and then once again, you've got this can, watering can here. So that's talking about the, the people that came from away and um, so the immigration story and the market gardeners. Um, and, yeah, and then talking about the fun of the show and how you have the, the, all the trophies and, and the prized, you know, animals and things like that. So... We had a, 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 amaz- a wall like this salon hang of um, paintings that were done over the years of all the different prize-winning animals um, for over the years and the trophies and had a, a video loop thing going of, um, of images throughout the years as well. So that was, that, was, um, that was lots of fun once it was in. Um, and to finish up, uh digitizing our collection so we've got all these objects that we have you know um with opportunities to display but also um sitting in of course in boxes um that we can we can bring to life through digitization so so there's digitizing for preservation and um and for sharing you know for use in, in online and things like that and there's digitization for, for condition assess you know recording and 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 things like that and there's also um this other 3d scanning project that we've been working with for a few couple of years now with um macquarie university so they've got um, a full lab out there so they do um a refracturing i can't remember what it's called now that refracturing lights or whatever it is now, it's gone from a brain, but then another sort of 3D style scanning as well. So they, and they, what they're doing is all the students are learning how to, to, to do this scanning um, techniques and they're using our collection material to do it. So it's a win-win for everyone. So I think we've got over a hundred of our objects now scanned, like 3D scanned. And then of course we get these fabulous still images as well that come um, along with, um, oh, if I go into the pedestal here, so that just shows you the more, um, some of these haven't got the information put in yet because they've got a, um, the, the latest batch that have gone through. So you've got this cute little toy soldier. It's one object. And he's done, I did the baker's, that big baker's cart as well that I was talking about before. So, yeah, so it's really quite good and you can zoom in and the quality is, is, is really fabulous. Um, yeah, and then um, if you want to um, put annotations on, it puts, it puts the, you know, your little pins on it so you can use it in reports or um, you can put different highlight different points on the surface so you know if you're a conservator you can sort of look more with different lights shows different different things so this is what this does too um you know you you um you're not having to handle the collection items which of course can damage them um or affect the deterioration so yeah so it's really quite fabulous that we've got this this great relationship with Macquarie University um who are doing and then you know there's things this small that they're scanning and there's this three meter long you know two meter wide high you know baker's cart that um that they can scan as well so have to get the card out to Macquarie University no um uh, we had it on display for the exhibition it was in storage and had been in storage for quite some time. So it was a, I had to get International Conservation Services to, to get it out. And then he did the, um, the scanning and on site. on site here whilst it was on display. Yeah. So, so with all this material as well, I mean, this is all fabulous to have this, but then we need to manage it as well. So that's one of the other things. Um, 
you know, we, we've got to be aware of is like we're not just caring for the physical objects, but we're now we've gone this digital realm. So we've got so many, so, so, so much digital material um, that we need to care for it and manage it going into the future. Um, so we're looking at uh, digital preservation management planning um, and how we do that because you've got the preservation masters and then you, you know, your TIFFs and then the, the different access copies and protecting all that and ICTP, ICT people like that. Like there's got so much material that they need to, to care for, but, yeah, it needs to be done. And so that's one of the projects we're working on at the moment. I think that's my time. Yes. Thanks, Hugh. We have time for questions. Um, some years ago, there was a talk given about transcribing the Parramatta, it was the Parramatta Minute book. So oh, yeah. How, how is that progressed? Um, we slowly, but we had um, we've had a few different volunteers working on it. Um, so that's using the Digivol. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if I can stop this from loading, if I go. Yeah, so we've managed to get a few of them up onto the website. Um, so this is the Parramatta History, History and Heritage Parramatta, you know, as you said, um, that's our website. Um, so, um, yeah, so we've managed to get a few of them transcribed and then actually we had the, um, a volunteer come along and, you know, transcribe them and we've uploaded them onto this website and then um, pull out some interesting extracts as well because they can be very dry <laughs> as well. So, yeah, dig around in here and you'll, and you'll, and you'll find that, um, that some of them are there. Vernon. Yeah, it's a Vernon browser. Yeah. And... Those three images. Those are those the three Ds are on, uh, like on a on a separate platform. So if you look like for the um, if you get the three D scanning, okay. So if I just go home. Oh, this is the, if I just digress here. This Black Friday. Is these are images from the archives and they're being put out every for every Friday. And there's some fabulous images there. So they're engineers' photos that were taken in the 1950s to the 1970s. So it's when they were doing works. Um, so yeah, some really, really great photos in there. So yes, yeah, so if you just come into here, so you look for the 3D scanning of cultural collections, um, that platform's in there for the 3D. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yes. Okay. So if I go back to the browser, so that's in here, the Vernon browser. So that's not the 3D. That's our, that's our collection. So this is, this is the Vernon browser. Um, so our, our catalogue database system is Vernon, and then we pulled out probably too many of our records and put them into the browser. Um, so it can be, it's a work in progress as well. Um, so, yeah, so you come in here. So if I, um, yeah, so that's that wool sample. So um, there's that exterminator polish thing tin here. So, you know, so that's what it looks like. You know, and you've got the small description there and then different images. Yeah. So if you want to do, it's that typical thing, if you want to do a, um, like a key key search, it's the inverted commas, um, and then I think for the where is it? Um, yeah, yeah, for the series of words, I should say, like so it recognizes it and doesn't find out. You know, James Pi, you're looking for James, and looking for Pi, you'll get everything up, like you use inverted commas, and I think it's the same as a lot of search engine um, search databases, and then you've got your wildcard. Thing too, if you're not sure how something's spelt, then you do the asterisk here's for that. Yeah. So, yes. Oh.
uh, very briefly, what's involved in the 3D scan and how long does that take for an object? Um, so what we do is we work with Macquarie University. It's a partnership with them. It's one of their programs for their students' learning. Um, so we will give a batch of, say, 50 items to them for a term and they work on it for a term, say, and then we get that, those 50 back and get another batch and send them over. Yeah. So the, the, he's got a number of students that are, are in a fabulous lab over there at Macquarie University um, that, yeah, they're, they're set up with all, all the equipment. Obviously the equipment's very expensive. It's one they do. Well, what we're doing, we've got this partnership. So we were, we were so fortunate because um, what it's doing is the, the um the idea from Macquarie was like to give a real world situation to these students. So we actually are treated as a client. Um, so we um, go through that whole proper process of like showing them um, handling um, of objects and that's actually we, we do the whole documentation as, you know, an outward loan, you know, the, and then return. And so it's all these proper processes and they get to see across all that and plus they're learning all their, their digitisation skills. So it's 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 a no cost. Yeah. Um, because it, a number of years ago, um, well, probably I've been here for three and a half years now, so just prior to that there was a project to do 3D scanning and, um you know, it was costing $5,000 or something per object and the quality wasn't great. Um, but that's digitisation, you know, that's, that's technology improving, you know, over time. Yeah. So we're, we're very lucky to have this partnership. It's an ongoing project for a long time. As long as they're happy with digitising our objects. <laughs> yeah. And then see, see Pedestal, see, it's Macquarie University that do the, do the work, and then Pedestal 3D is a, is a platform that hosts that, that, those images on our website. He's got the same hat. I mean, he's got the same guy but a different hat. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So we pay for the licence to, to have that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. How does your storage area? Um, we've got close to 300 square metres. Um, of storage area. Um, so I would say a hundred of that would be council archives, um, and and a, and, a sm and community archives, which is just a smaller proportion of the council archives. Um, and then we've got the other area, which is like that's environmentally environmentally controlled, and then the other area. Is, is where all the, the cultural collections are held, environmentally controlled area, and all the, the compactus and shelving. Yeah. Uh, no, um, we, well, it's a very small team. Um, it's probably one of the problems over the years is, um, you know, the co conservation is, you know, once again, you've got a, a very small team to manage a huge collection. And, um, and years ago, there wasn't collection management policies. You know, that's the same as any, any collecting institution from years ago. You've just got so much material um, before policies were put in place to try to protect you um, from collecting too much, which means because once you accept it, you know, you, you have to care for it. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Good job. <laughs> Thank you. Next up, we've got three presentations that were presented at the risk of the complex. Um, I'll wipe them and then um, so one's online and two on site. Two online, one on site. The conference was held in Tasmania. And if you get a chance to go to the United States, we can't have such a mind inflation and really good way to find out what's going on with each thing. I'll show this first. I've just got to get to the right bit because I. 
I, I used to have it all memorized, but I don't know who's first either. So we'll be just progressing to there and I'll have to unmute the speakers too. Okay, I'll just unmute um, Catherine. Here we go. Hi everyone, I hope you can all hear me. Um, so my name is Catherine McLean. I'm the Acting Systems and Collections Librarian uh, working in Eden. Um, okay. You're online. Yeah, yeah it's exactly. all going to work out. I just didn't want to get in when we were talking. When, yes, most people can't hear Okay, so we might need. Okay, so. Is coming through online. Should he be doing the presentation? I'll be moving this slides along for him. Yeah, everything. But maybe it was hiding something. It's unmuted online. Oh, you Bruce coming through the computer. Can you try now? I can. Can you hear me now? No, I'm still can't hear. No, still nothing. Um, Maybe by unsharing and red sharing process, some weird new option. Yeah. I did presentation with share sound and optimized for video clip because I'm trying to, but I could share everything in case optimize for video clip again. Definitely unmuted. Yeah, I can't. Okay. I'll be able to hear because it's coming through the sound outputs correct. Can you try again, Catherine, please? Yeah, absolutely. Are you able to hear me now? No? Okay. Is it further I can hear from this? Okay. Yes. So She's audible for those online. She's not audible for those in the room. And Fran will also. Yeah. Try that one. No, it's not here. Oh, it doesn't. Oh, there we go. You try now. Okay. okay, how are we going? Oh. 
No. Oh. <laughs> well, you really practice it and it doesn't work at the time. So please be patient and please do not view that this technology is destroying the whole day. What are you doing? Please let people do online. It's actually it's really important. important. It's yeah. 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 Okay, how was that? Are we having luck? Frank, you try copying. No. It definitely should be quick share. I'll call one of the um other guys to see if he can. Maybe we we'll step forward to Julie, who's in the room, and come back. Sounds good. <laughs> Oh, oh, yeah. um, I've just got, so we're trying to connect some um, people through Zoom, so the, the ones at home, um, we can hear them, and we've connected to the ClickShare speakers, but it's still not coming through. Mm, yeah. Yeah, it's going. thank you. Okay, bye. We're going low text. Okay, yeah, we're not sure why that's not working. That's all. Beautiful. Friendships. From council? Yeah, from Okay, let's test that. Okay, how are we looking? Are we able to hear this online? Okay, just let me know if you can hear me. Oh, yeah, sorry, there are children in the next room. We've just had a rhyme time session this morning. So that's, that's like one and the same here. Yeah. <laughs> 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 That's coming from my laptop. Mm -hmm. Can you move your laptop as well so there's not a double feedback? Um, I'm getting the sound from my laptop though. As in, you, you, you want your mic? Oh, yeah. So. Um, Catherine, can you try to talk? Yeah, I can try to talk. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? <laughs> Can you hear me at all now? Cool, we can hear you. Okay, success. Great work. Technology, it's one of those things. It's amazing when it works well and then it has its moments and puts us all on the spot. 
Okay, so we're ready for me to get started. Where I'll go. So hi, I'm Catherine McLean. I'm the Acting Systems and Collections Librarian and part of the Bega Valley Shire Library. <laughs> so Eden, where I'm located, is on the far south coast of New South Wales on Newin Country, only half an hour drive from the Victorian border. Eden's a nature's lover's paradise and a small remote community surrounded by beaches and national parks. The reason I'm telling you a little bit about the area is because it's very relevant as to how our old history project came about, but I'll come back to that in a moment. Initially, when we applied for a funding grant through the State Library, we had a project in mind to record the oral histories of First Nations peoples connected with a large photographic collection that we had, had donated to the library. But then an unexpected opportunity presented itself. You would have all heard of the devastation of the Black Summer bushfires. On New Year's Eve of 2019, the threat to our home here became very real. With the bush extremely dry, a fast-moving fire started south of the Victorian border. This fire, which became known as the Border Fire at the time, because it must have been Victoria's fault, raced up and out of control northwards over the New South Wales border to devastate the bush and impact the communities of Wanboyne and the surrounding areas. Yeah. The border fire consumed 60,000 hectares, 150,000 acres of bush in the local area and many homes were lost. So six weeks after the bushfires, a regular customer and local author, Susan Sarah, came into the library and was talking to me about an idea that she had about for a new book. She was going to interview local residents of Womboing, where she lived, about their experience of the bushfires and write her book based on their stories. The only problem was that she had not interviewed people for a book before and she was quite unsure about the process. A colleague and I had recently attended the State Library training for the oral history kits. So part of the grant, and we saw this as a great opportunity to partner with her. I had some shiny new equipment and some recent training and she had local contacts and needed help with recordings. So a partnership was formed. I travelled out to the community to conduct the interviews on the site. And it was very, it was very humbling and very confronting experience travelling out to Womboyne. So for context, it's a 40 minute drive um, and the entire 40 minute drive, um, I was just surrounded by this unending charred landscape. So I went to interview community members in their homes and for one couple, the undercover area of their shed where that was where they had, were living as they had lost their home. I was amazed by the positivity and the resilience that people showed while they were being surrounded by so much loss, if not their own homes, then at least for the environment around them. I met some incredible people who shared with me their stories of courage, strength and resilience. So in this photo that you can see here, this is Paul and Oksana. Um, they lost their home as part of the bushfire in the most unlikely of circumstances. They had a night brick home. Um, but it was hit by a fire. My daughter put out a note that actually said, you know, Dad's a large lump of a lad. Can anybody? That's okay, we can play that one. Um, is that going to work? Um, so the, the click that's about to play. And so when we went to the op shop from her church, we opened. Um, so this is um, what I love about this clip that you can hear is you can actually hear the sounds of construction in the background and that was um, the workers there as they worked to convert their shed which had survived into a livable space. It was a really you know poignant reminder that it was a very tr real tragedy with um, but there were also that ongoing resilience and recovery. It and it was just full of brand new clubs. Oh, how wonderful. And how did she so, go with so not being able to contact you? And well, we were, the first contact with her was on a police, um, I borrowed the police satellite phone just to tell her we were all right because there was no comms here. Mm -hmm. yes. So that dropped out. So she then sent an SMS on the police comms and the policeman said, I didn't know this could actually receive SMS. Yeah. So he said, that'll be interesting talking to my boss about, uh, hello, Dad, I hope you're glad you're safe. <laughs> Um, so we went through all of that, and then we discovered that if we drove to Scrubby Creek, you know, we could. Um, so we would we were probably at three or four hours a day at Scrubby Creek, just actually uh, uh, dodging falling trees and fires and uh, making phone calls. <coughs> and we had no electricity or no again. generators at that stage because our generator burnt in the fire. So, so in the. End 
The next clip that I'd like to play for you is from my interview with Sarah. Sarah Birch. Um, what I love about this recording is you really get that sense of place. Um, you can hear birdsong in the background, which in itself, considering the magnitude of the fires and what happened in that area was an absolute miracle. Um, by luck or by chance, the very centre of Womboy in the town itself was untouched. So it was a kind of oasis in the middle of so much destruction. This recording also captures the small details of the bushfire experience um, and it really captures the feeling of being in that moment. So the, the preparation, the concerns, the little details that would otherwise be lost. And I think actually he, he missed that call and I looked at my phone and the update came through to say that we needed to evacuate. Oh, okay. Was that through the text message? Or was that yeah. the text message? Through the text message. Yes. So I got the text message to say um, that it would be safe to leave now. Mm -hmm. And I came to my kitchen window and opened up the blind and there were guests who, who were staying at the park in the cabins next to us standing there. And it had all of a sudden I'd walked from one end of the house to the other, tried to make a phone call. And in that time, <coughs> it had basically gone from orange to red, dark atmosphere. And I opened up my window and the people are all standing there and they're like, Sarah, what, what, what are you doing? What are we doing? And I was like, I've just woken up. I don't, I don't know how I've just tried to call Luke. And, and I've just got this message. We're all kind of standing there with our phones. There are about four of them. They were from the family that I'd just taken photos oh, of right, the, okay. the, um, the day before. Um, and it just started to feel panicky. It started to feel like it wasn't, that, that something was about to happen, that we needed to leave. So mm -hmm. um, Luke came in and I said, what, like, what's this? I've got this message. How are you going? What are you doing? Did you just see that guy with the boat? Like, we're there for a few things going on. Where's Louis? What, you know, where are all of our kids? What's going on? And he was a bit too busy to talk. He was just like, you just get, get out, like, just leave. Mm -hmm. with the kids that's what's safest and that's what the text message has told us to do and we'll just catch up later so <laughs> i was just thinking what do i pack what do <laughs> i put in and i probably ended up packing all of the wrong things i think i packed lots of clothes and barely any food and just i did pack toothbrushes and that is for violet which was helpful but I just didn't, I actually asked the kids to pack something special thinking that they would pack like a soft toy or something, but they packed their sword and shield. So yeah. the moment I now look back and think I was just saying goodbye to him and it didn't feel right leaving without him. It was the kids, myself and Naomi and the things that we thought were important in the boot. And we kind of just, just rushed off um, and didn't, didn't say like a proper goodbye. It was just, it was just all really busy and intense. And on the last slide, on the last clip that I'd like to play for you is uh, Remy Birch. So Remy is Sarah's son. And although I found this a really challenging interview, um, it was very different interviewing a child and they take very long pauses. Um, but I decided that these pauses were quite important to keep in it really captured how much he was thinking about the response to his questions. And it also gave another lens on what was important to a child in this situation. So you've got lots of wonderful wildlife around here. Yeah. And a few snakes. A few snakes too. Mm -hmm. You're very lucky to live somewhere so beautiful. But not anymore. Not at the moment. Do you think it will get beautiful again? Yeah. Do you think that the, everything will start to go really green? Mm hmm There's already grass starting to grow at the maintenance shed. Oh, great. So we had a steep learning curve with yeah, the development of these of oral histories. Um, not only was there the actual recordings that we needed to establish procedures and protocols for the interviews, um, ensuring we had the correct permissions, that we recorded enough data at the time of the interview. One problem that I encountered was not giving good advance notice that we would like to take a photo of them to accompany their recording. 
So actually no one on the day was happy to have their photo done. So there was a lot of follow-up work involved in having them provide an image of their choosing and then doing that appropriate paperwork. We also needed to add a whole new format of collection material to our catalogue as we didn't actually have any previous oral histories in the catalogue at all. So there was a steep learning curve there as well. So just from here, uh, we did put a call out to seek more bushfire stories, but we didn't have as much take up as we would have thought. Um, but due to the sensitive nature of that experience, we're um, very conscious of not putting too much pressure on people um, as they are part of their healing journey as well. Now I'd like to introduce Julie from Central West Libraries. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so my name's Julie Sykes. I'm from Orange Library. And um, I'd just like to show you where Orange is for those people who um, don't know. Do I do, are you going to click through I'm this, Ellen? Not that I've been doing a great job so far. <laughs> so Orange is about 250 kilometres west of Sydney, about a four-hour train trip, which I've been on this, this morning to get here. Um, the, area, the area is a great tourist destination known for the first payable gold at Ofa in 1851, um, old heritage buildings, wine and food, and the, the food um, is on this weekend. If you're going to go anywhere, this is a good weekend to go to Orange. So there's lots of tourism and farming. Um, Central West Libraries, where I work, comprises seven libraries over five councils. So there's Orange City, where I'm based, Blaney, Gabon, Cowra and Forbes. So when we did um, the training with Ellen, I went back to the library and had all these, we had all these wonderful oral history ideas and plans. We were going to um, talk to people about their memories of the days, days that Templars Mill, the birthplace of Banjo Patterson, came tumbling, crashing down in the 70s. The springs, the 1920s to 1930s Aboriginal fringe camp, that was on the outskirts of Orange City. The establishment of food, which is the Food of Orange District, which was almost, well, it was 30 years ago last year, and we still haven't done that. And the history of gold mining at Wentworth Mine. So when COVID hit, we were unable to have our oral history um, volunteers in the library. So what I decided to do was to join the State Libraries Project and interview our staff at the library who were a court audience, they couldn't get away from me, um, in their different roles to share their experiences of COVID-19 pandemic and focus on the changes in the library services and community needs. So here are a few pictures of um, the people that I interviewed. So there was um, Jan Richards who at the time was manager of Central West Libraries. Sean Brady's there helping me to set up the equipment in our MEB room. Jasmine Weidler, who is our reading writing coordinator. And the next one shows you Trudy Mayfield, our heritage research librarian. And Alex Gibb has her mask on in the top. And um, Ruth Bingham, she's one of our library assistants from Blaney Library. So see, the Central West Libraries was one of the last libraries to close down to the public on the 25th of March, 2020, and the first to reopen on the 1st of June, 2020. Our oral history volunteers were unable to return and they're still not back in the library um, today doing recordings because of their age. A lot of them um, are very vulnerable and we're very sensitive to that. So we haven't invited them back to do um, more interviews as yet. Um, what we found most of the staff said was that um, they were anxious. They remember the suddenness of the closure of the library service and we kept running to try and keep up with the changes so that we could give some sort of service. 
This clip is Jan Richards, our manager, and what she had to say. It was a shock because it all happened so quickly. And so we had to think uh, very fast about what we were going to do and how we were going to deliver library services. I was really proud of the team at how nimble they were and at how they were able to offer services in a different way, but it changed that traditional model of, um, of a public library. And uh, I think that it will be a change that in some ways may be um, irreversible, uh, as in I don't think we'll ever go back to exactly as we were before. Time is a shock because it all happened. So, as Jan said, um, it was upended way of working. It was a new way of delivery. We had a strong um, input from our online services. We, at the same time, Orange never does anything in half measures. While we were close to the public, we also um, took the opportunity to refurbish our upstairs administration area, which meant that we had to bring everything downstairs on the floor of the library and re-carpet, repaint, you name it, we were doing it while we were trying to um, do this, uh, the sources again. The next clip is Trudy Mayfield. Um, we just asked people what were the sights and sounds, tastes and smells of COVID that they remembered at the time. Face mask was the latest fashion accessory in all different shapes and sizes and formats. But what surprises me is that they aren't necessarily worn properly. Like often they'll just cover the mouth and not the nose or um, not quite often they've worn around the neck. <laughs> uh, sounds, well, working from home, I've actually been playing all my old cassette tapes, working through them, starting at number one, <laughs> and I've got maybe 300. So I've been listening to um, quite nostalgic music, a lot of it dating back to the 1970s. Uh, smells, well, at home, not... <laughs> They are two fairly quiet recordings, just to be clear. <laughs> yeah, the speakers are at max volume. The, yeah. Um, the remarkable odour of yeah. the M20. That's as, and the it's as loud as it's going to get. Yeah. <laughs> it tends to stick in your, in your throat. <laughs> I'm sure you've all got your own sounds, tastes, smells that you remember. So problems that um, we in well, I encountered were that I was doing this by myself and it was hard to be multitasking and learning a new system of going through. I was very inexperienced in interviewing and people would simply answer the question and I didn't have enough backup questions to keep them talking. I was trying to head down this tunnel. Some of the staff, well, a lot of the staff were um, too shy. They didn't want to be interviewed. And I'm sure that happens no matter, you know, what your project is that you're doing. Um, and on top of that, the interviews occurred a few months after lockdown. So and they were, most of the staff were relying on their memory of um, what happened. So lockdown was April, May, and I was interviewing in late July. Um, so my take home was that the process needs to be planned mm -hmm. and it's great to have um, extra staff there when you're um, doing your monitoring and those sorts of things. I actually lost a couple of um, tapes because I was trying to talk to people and watch equipment and hadn't realised that, um, that, that I wasn't taping at all. And once you try and do that a second time, you've got people that are very hurried, they give you a different answer sometimes to your question. Um, but I think that uh, the staff found it cathartic that they could actually talk about some of the problems and um, for that reason the project was very worth, worthwhile. And I thank Ellen 
and being able to do that. And I'd like to hand that over to Fran Goldberg. Oh, okay. Can everybody hear me? Can, yes. Shall I start? Please let me know if you can't hear me. Um, hi, my name's Fran and I'm with Goulburn Mulwari Library. Goulburn is a thriving regional city, rich in heritage and natural beauty. Two hours from Sydney, an hour from Canberra and just under two hours to the coast. The region is rural and includes many villages and localities. Population growth over the last 12 months is higher than the regional average. The region was traditionally a meeting place for many Aboriginal groups, with Goulburn itself containing important cultural heritage sites. Traditional countries identified within the region include the Gundungurra, Ngunnawal and Wiradjuri. As part of the uh, next slide, please. As part of, thanks Ellen. As part of the development of a new local studies strategic policy, the team was actively seeking to increase our contemporary collection. When the opportunity arose to apply for the portable oral history project, so it was a great timing for us. Um, our oral history team was created by combining the local studies officer, myself, with our mobile library officer, who was Maria Daly at the time. We now had the knowledge, experience and regional contacts and a big red bus for portability. Once we had received our kit, we wasted no time in generating community interest through media stories, visits to events and promotion. We attended Seniors Week activities, offering time capsules to interested participants, where they could tell us a 10 minute story of their life, which we recorded and gave back to them as a memento. And it all created a buzz and gave us some contacts for future use. We focused on the brief of searching out underrepresented stories. As a result, we have a great diversity among our interview subjects. We had some setbacks along the way. Not all our initial contacts decided to be interviewed. And, um, you know, it's, there's very good reasons why people are underrepresented in communities. So we've got to go that extra mile and try to make them feel comfortable about sharing their stories. And um, some of our interviews had to be postponed and rescheduled. Um, but uh, the lockdowns suited us as Maria um, was able to take the time to create our transcripts from the completed interviews. The interview we are highlighting today is a great example of a very local story from a man with a wonderful deep connection to country. By connecting with Alfie, we have made further inroads further into our community and look forward to exploring these connections. First Nations people should be aware that this presentation contains images of deceased persons. According to the Goulburn Mulwari Council Delivery Program, 2.8% of residents identify as being of Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander ancestry, and fewer than 3% of the population speak a language other than English at home. The most common of these being Greek, Italian and German. Um, Alfie was recorded on the 4th of September 2020. He is a Wiradjuri and Yuan man. Firstly, you will hear Alfie speak of his connection to Goulburn and why for him this is the most beautiful place in the world. Yep, you can play the recording, Ellen. I'm just having trouble getting the mouse. You've had this before, haven't we? Mm. I've, I've, I've travelled all over the world. Yes. Um, I've seen, you know, I've gone to Japan. I've seen some beautiful things in um, Canada when I was there um, with the with the uh, members of the Cree community. And okay. when I visited, um, you know, my, one of my friends over there was the youth grand chief of the Cree nation. And, you know, got to spend time with their family. So, uh, and we've seen a lot of the world, including, you know, Europe and our, our wonderful um, family and friends over in Europe that we visited um, recently with the theatre. But, but there's one place that I just love over all those places. 
And um, if you go up the top of Mount Grey and uh, you look out across Goulburn, you can mm. see Rocky Hill in the distance. Mm. You can see Mount Borbore. You can see the Colouran Range. If you look over your shoulder to the right, you can see the Cook Bun Dunes. You can see up the highway towards Sydney. Yeah. You look to your left, you can see all the way to Canberra, almost down, also down to, to um, Braidwood and to the south coast. And that spot there, I can take in um, all of my great-grandmother's country. Oh. You know, I can mm. I can stand there and imagine, you know, my great grandmother and her family and, and you know, the the Wallandilly clan moving throughout mm. this area and actually see the um, uh, the the beauty of this area. Mm. And I just love standing on Mount Grey and doing that. And it's even better at night. I've I've travelled all over the world. Yes. Um I've seen um, family means everything to Alfie. It is part of his identity and also informs his strong sense of community. Alfie contributes in many ways to his hometown, including in the performing arts as well as civic duties. He is a member of the PJAR Aboriginal Land Council, a youth leader, a cultural awareness facilitator, and has been an elected councillor for a decade and deputy mayor between 2016 and 2018. When I asked Alfie for his views on reconciliation, he spoke with clarity and conviction of his hope that eventually all Australians, regardless of their background or heritage, will take pride in and identify with First Nations people as part of everyone's national identity. Look, I think, um, you know, uh, the climate of the world right now is really challenging. Mm. Um, you know, uh, and I think, you know, one thing that I always share with people um, when I do acknowledgements of country or welcome to country or, you know, um, doing a bit of a speech or discussion around that sense of culture is that um, for an Australian person, if you hold an Australian passport, Australian birth certificate, uh, you are considered an Australian citizen, um, you have um, an Aboriginal identity or an Aboriginal background to your identity. You know, we are in a country with the oldest living culture in the world, mm. the absolute oldest living culture in the world, with amazing, um, uh, you know, maths and science associated with our culture, mm. um, you know, uh, aerodynamics with the boomerang and, you know, communications with, well, you know, different elements of uh, 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 the way we care for the bush mm. um, and the Australian bush, and we learned that from Aboriginal people and Aboriginal culture, you know... Um, it's a strong um, sense of my identity as an Aboriginal person, but I think that that idea of Aboriginal culture needs to be a strong sense of identity for Australian citizens, mm -hmm. a real mm -hmm. connection to um, our First Nations people. Yes. And, and so, you know, that I think we're tracking well, but I think we could be doing better. Mm. So um, in conclusion, our outreach into the community is greater than we anticipated. The success of our initial interviews has led to new referrals and projects. These include working with festivals and for the opening of, of Goulburn's new Performing Arts Centre, highlighting how the arts contribute to our society. We are proud of the deeper connections we have formed we have gone beyond our initial aim of filling gaps in our contemporary collection. We have created an awareness in the community of the importance of connection, the benefits of celebrating our diversity and sharing our stories. We have created a demand for the stories and have people contacting us and wanting to share their stories. Goulburn has a rich and important history but we also have a very relevant and diverse community with many new residents who have interesting, important stories to share. And our hope is that one day we can all recognize ourselves in our collection. Thank you guys. Thanks, Ellen. Any questions or comments? Okay, please join me with thanking Fran, um, Catherine and um, Julie.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your patience with the tech. <laughs> okay, over to Donna. It's now lunchtime. We've got an hour, but we will be back by 12 to Discussion until general business, and we'll just get straight into the 10 slides in five minutes. So we've got four, um, four topics, and Angela from Ryan is first up, and we have five minutes. The time starts. <laughs> Yeah, we all I need to use the forward arrow. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. So um, I want to pay my respects to the Wally Medigals, who are the traditional owners of the land on which this talk was prepared. So what it was was a bilingual English and Mandarin talk about Chinese market gardens and gardeners of the Ryden Eastwood municipalities. It was part of the Lunar New Year festivities. And we did it at the Eastwood branch, which has a high percentage of Mandarin speakers in the resident population. The who was myself and a colleague, Ling Huang. She has great translation skills. She wanted to be involved and she was happy to present, though she didn't have experience presenting to adults. So she had done a lot of rhyme times and story times and was a very confident person. So preparation, I prepared a full script and the PowerPoint one month in advance of the presentation. Now, I never do a full script for a talk. There's a lot of ad-libbing, but I thought, well, hang on, that's not really fair yeah. Yeah. If, you're expecting, if you're expecting somebody to do a translation. Um, I spent several hours with her going through the script and the PowerPoint, and we agreed how we'd break it up for the translation. So we weren't interrupting each other or not talking for too long in either language. So there's no point in having someone give 10 minutes in English and then 10 minutes in Mandarin because you've, you've got half your audience disengaged. Then I left her to it. So she prepared the translation. She sent her translation to a colleague to check. So this is not a Google Translate job the night before. And she followed up with me on several occasions to clarify certain points. So, for example, she said, did they grow fruit? And I said, no, because they were only renting the land. And so to grow fruit, you need a couple of years. They needed something that they could get quick returns on. And I said, in any way, if they were growing fruit, it would be an orchard. So then we went through the difference between an orchard and a market garden and a farm. And she had to take that on board in terms of her translation. So the result, we had 23 attendees, some were English only speakers, some were Mandarin only speakers, and some were bilingual. I can't tell you how pleased I was that there were some Mandarin only speakers in the room because it would have been terrible for her to have gone to have all that trouble and only have English speakers in the room. SBS Chinese was there. And the presentation was about 50 minutes with 40 minutes of questions and discussion. So this is what I took away. The importance of having the support from the branch, especially for promotion and setup. Most of our advertising and promotion is in English. We have some bilingual brochures, but I think most of the attendees came because they'd been handed a brochure at the branch They'd been spoken to, and the branch was enthusiastic about having this talk there. The importance of preparing a verbatim script and the accompanying PowerPoint and giving your co-presenter enough time to do a good translation and to do some practice. And this is the most important point, I think. It works with a dot point kind of talk. It's not going to work with every kind of talk. So we did the, I would do the, the English at the end, sorry, I would talk from a PowerPoint and then she would do the translation at the end of that slide. So it was probably 30 seconds backwards and forwards. So there was no long period of time that half the audience was, was unengaged. 
I would like to do a follow-up talk because I think there is interest, more stories from the market gardens. But to tell a story, you need about seven or ten minutes. Well, you can't do sentence-for-sentence sentence translation if you're wanting to tell a story. And likewise, you can't have ten minutes of English and ten minutes of Mandarin because that would be really boring. So I think in the future, if I wanted to do that kind of talk, I'd prepare an English talk and I would present that and then one of my colleagues could translate that and present it as a separate talk fully in Mandarin and I'd be available to answer the questions. This was Ling's tape. The thing, as we were answering the question, she said, I needed to have a pen and paper because she was being asked questions. She needed to write the details down to make sure that she got all of the all of the aspects of the question, she said, I really should have had a pen and paper there. Choose wisely. Choose your staff member very wisely. Choose a staff member who wants to be involved. Just because someone has the requisite language skills doesn't mean they have the interest to do the work that is required. But if someone is lacking confidence, you take the lead and treat it as a professional development opportunity. So of those three, language skills, interest, and uh, the ability to speak, I think the first two are the language skills and the interest, and you can work with a colleague on the presentation skills. Your English presentation has to be a lot shorter than you would usually present, which is a bit obvious. So if you normally talk for 50 minutes, it's got to be prepared for 25 minutes because it's going to take the same amount of time to give it in Mandarin or whatever other language you do. Um, and program for a longer than usual question time because it's going to take double the amount of time anyway by the time you do your translation. And lots of times these topics will result in a lot of questions and discussion. Thank you. John McRitchie is up next. I'm just having someone. Is there lost property? Oh, not the lost property box in the lottery. You know what? They're my glasses. Uh, uh, sorry, my glasses. <laughs> I love the actual Here you go. Thanks for bringing it back. Yeah. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm John McLeachy. I'm local studies librarian with George's River Libraries, working out of Herschel Library. George's River has a cultural strategy, and we see as a priority the task of engaging with our community. How does local studies do this? Some of the best publications for studying the history of our area are inconvenient to access and are uninspiring in appearance. We want to make the material available widely in an attractive presentation. Local history publications are often in pamphlet or booklet format elusive to find on the shelves, not prominent. Often we only make them available as closed access reference items. Many were written in the flush of interest that followed the 1988 bicentennial and were published with limited means and never subsequently republished. How do we make these more available? Can we make them available to a readership beyond George's River? And that brings me to Indie Reads. What is Indie Reads? Uh, there's more information, obviously, on the State Library website. Uh, Ross Balhari has the oversight of it. What you don't do is go to the, new st to the State Library website and put in Indie Reads, because that brings up Indie Reads, the Journal of Indianapolis Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> Indie Reads is an e-content management platform which circulates digital titles to registered library card holders. It allows public libraries to act as aggregators of locally important content. So you are all potential aggregators. 
You can upload digitized books, manuscripts, ephemera, oral histories, music, and video content onto the stipulating which mark fields have to be filled in and so on. Luckily, I stayed well clear of that stuff. Mm -hmm. This is an example of one of the works I wanted to make more available. It was written by a local historian using the resources available to her in 1981, pre-digitization, just about pre-typewriter. Marty <laughs> Stettler comes to mind. Uh, a modest print run long out of print unappealing TypeScript format, stapled, no photos, no footnotes. But in fact, it's still reasonably good quality information about these particular suburbs presented in a compact format. The author is deceased and the society that published the items imploded and passed its assets over to George Rib. We uploaded items in a standard template using George's River corporate colors, which include teal, and we had teal first. <laughs> the first logo is buying up front. The second page is an acknowledgement, acknowledgement of country. Um, if you print it out, it prints out to an A4 page format. I took the opportunity to illustrate the material with images from our collection, uh, because previously the items had no illustrations. But I felt that footnoting would be helpful. I added augmentation in the form of footnotes giving the fresh information that had become available since the items were written. Our catalog runs off spiders, and this shows the layout of a catalog search. The view availability prompt links to an option to electronically borrow the item. You can download it to a device or you can read it as a, a document on your screen. Some of the documents required original cataloging as they were newly created items. And uh, kudos to my excellent cataloger, Nelly Wong, who did a great job. In one or two cases, we've added cultural sensitivity warnings because content that was all right in 91, uh, by their way of thinking, is no longer quite acceptable. It's possible to have a series uh, hyperlink where items are in a related sequence like the two that are on the screen. The initial loan period is 21 days, but items can be returned before that, and it's possible to reserve items that are on loan. Loan statistics are provided, and we were advised that if we put George's River Libraries in uh, the Mark Publisher field, then they derive loan stats from that, and we are then uh, able to call the stats. As we've only been going for a couple of weeks, we don't have any stats yet, but it's looking promising. Some things have been borrowed, not just to staff members. A feature of the Indie Reads platform is the possibility of adding a star rating and providing comments, which we would moderate. There is the option to follow an author, so I am currently following myself. It's not a pretty sight. It also allows you to preview a sample of the item before you borrow. Uh, you provide a brief description of the item at the cataloging stage, and you can add tags as well to make it more uh, available. We have 30 items now on Indie Reads, which are achieving a wider audience, and I look forward to adding more. Thank you. Except she's not on screen on online at present. Uh, I should be here. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, okay. So you just oh, yeah. This, the, uh, oh, here we go. Yep. Oh. Um, I'll just link my presentation. Hopefully. Um, hold on. Um, can you see that? Yes. Yep. Okay, good. Um, okay, can we see that and hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, excellent. Thank you. 
Um, so I'm Simone Taylor. I'm the local studies officer at Dubbo Regional Council. Um, and I work out of our uh, Western Plains Cultural Centre, which is our museum and gallery space. Um, before I begin, I just wanted to recognise the traditional owners um, of the Wiradjuri country and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Okay, so uh, digital preservation, um, interesting topic, um, pretty daunting. I'm, I'm not very techie myself, so it was a, a an interesting project for me to work on. And um, so our um, organization has just started to kind of look at some of the issues around um, long-term digital preservation of our digital collections. And um, from all the different preservations I've, presentations I should say I've heard today, there's quite a lot of um, different local studies um, projects that are working in the digital sphere. So um, I think this is quite a topical um, issue to be discussing. Um, so how many are you, how many of us are actually aware of some of the complexities around long term digital preservation. Um, I had to have I've, as part of this project I really had to get my head around some very um, interesting concepts things like lossless compression technological obsolescence. Um, born digital and things like that. So I thought I'd provide you guys with a little bit of a brief overview about some of the things that I've discovered through this project that might help you making your own decisions around how to care for your own collections. Um, so what is digital preservation? Digital preservation is the coordinated and ongoing set of processes that ensure long-term error-free storage of digital information. So there are two types of digital uh, material. The first is object, physical objects that have been copied or scanned to create a, a digital format. So you digitize photographs, documents, things like that. The other type of digital content is born digital materials. Um, and these are materials that only exist in a digital format. They are not copies of analog documents. So these digital materials can be um, quite simple or quite complex. They can be as simple as a digitized photograph or as co or complex hybrid network, networked um, and dynamic content, such as you might find on social media platforms, on websites, games, digital art, things like that. And it's easy to think of them as, as quite stable. Um, unlike our physical collections, they're not gonna be um, infected by pest or damaged by light, but actually they're some of, probably some of our most fragile um, things in our collections. Um, they are subject to a number of threats. Um, significant threats include file degradation. So nearly all digital files will decay over time and they can be affected by issues such as bit rot. Also, the digital storage that we use um, generally doesn't have a long lifespan. Um, it's probably most digital storage technologies are only have a lifespan about five years. So um, that's something to take into account. Uh, technological obsolescence. Now that occurs when the propriety software or hardware falls out of common use, making that digital media um, inaccessible. And that is often seen as one of the greatest threats to born digital mediums. Copyright. So a lot of digital materials, uh, it's difficult to identify copyright, especially things that are highly fluid, created with multiple users or have a wide group of users. Um, software and online platforms can also hold priority soft, uh, rights over content and access, making it difficult to collect. Furthermore, um, as far as I can tell, um, the Australian copyright law as of 2012 doesn't actually have any specific legislation around the preservation of born digital materials. Finally, disasters. Even though they're digital and they don't have a physical reality, they still can be influenced by physical threats such as fires and floods that can damage or destroy the hardware that's used to store that content. So how can we protect our collections? Um, so that's an ongoing challenge, but there is some um, solutions that have been developed to help us mitigate some of these risk factors. Um, significantly, um, a proactive life cycle management plan for your digital collections is very important. Um, and it includes factoring some things such as use of preservation friendly formats, ensuring that metadata is collected with your digital 
um, content. Um, regular integrity checking using tools such as checksums and things like that. Um, monitoring your digital storage capabilities. Emulating or using programs that can emulate old hardware and software to reduce technological obsolescence. Migration of data into preservation friendly file formats and reviewing emergency technologies, things like blockchain and NFTs that might help us with our preservation or access. A key element of this life cycle management is the incorporation as well of system redundancies. Um, and this is basically just having multiple copies of your collection stored independently to reduce that risk of loss of data. Now, obviously these processes are, will require um, a lot of staff capacity and a lot of digital storage, and therefore will increase costs of our collections. At the moment, as far as I can tell, only the very large well-funded institutions like Cleveland Museum of Art are actually implementing digital preservation um, formats to this level. However, I think there's a few things from some of this that you, you can um, institute in your own institutions that are not too um, onerous and that might help protect your collections. So, um, as an emerging field, um, the successful long-term storage of digital solutions has actually not yet been fully implemented. We haven't actually had any digital collections um, preserved for long enough to know what's gonna work in 10, 50, oh, probably 10, but in 50, 100 years time. However, there is an international field of digital, digital preservation that's responding to these problems and is developing a lot of key standards that we can implement ourselves in the care of our cultural collections. Uh, it's not, um, I mean, we can't ignore digital, the digital realm. Um, we can't ignore born digital um, as a form of social life, as a form of cultural life. And as the keepers of our cultural heritage, we have a responsibility to find ways to preserve this digital world. Um, and a part of that is to find ways to um, make sure it's preserved for current generations, but also for future generations. So a couple of the um, really interesting um, websites that I found that helped me with um, my work was the Digital Preservation Handbook and the Collecting and Preserving Digital Materials. Um, both are really good resources if you want to follow up and look into um, some of these issues a bit more thoroughly. Uh, thank you. Hello everyone, can you hear me? And all good online? Thank you. Um, my name's Alison Wishart. I work at Bayside Council as a local history librarian and curator. And I would like to acknowledge that the exhibition I'm going to talk to you about today is on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. So I'm going to briefly take you through um, what worked and what didn't um, in this exhibition, which is um, currently on display until the end of July. So if you like what you see, you can just come and visit us in real life. Um, the exhibition has uh, two entry points and who can guess what we've got around what you might call like the um, skirting board of the exhibition there? Some lane ropes, yes, that's right. So um, this exhibition is all about swimming. Uh, so uh, I was able to um, use the old lane ropes from the um, swimming pool as part of the exhibition props. Uh, so I think do use props, they bring the space alive. And look, a photograph with no text, oh my God, I know it was hard, but the text is in the exhibition. So the idea is that people go, what is that? Where is that? I'll go into the exhibition and find out. Um, just to mention too, we did have long discussions about whether children would come and 
take the uh, lane ropes out of the garbage bins and create havoc in our lovely library hasn't happened yet and they haven't even gone close. So, of course, the exhibition starts with um, uh, what the Aboriginal people in the area, how they used the water and Botany Bay. And I think it's really important to construct a narrative. And we all know that a narrative has three parts, beginning, middle, end. So your exhibition has to have those three components. The story is what will bring people in. I've created the exhibition into chapters or chunks or sections, however you want to call it. And why do we do that? It's because it reduces visitor fatigue and it helps people to absorb the content because they can move from section to section, break down big job into small job. Everyone likes that. And I, I fiddled around with this, but I gave each of the chapters or sections um, a title that's kind of fitted with um, the idea of swimming. Uh, and if you're very clever, you'll, you'll see that the dog paddle is like stuff is moving very slowly in time at that point. And butterfly is the most elegant part of our um, uh, swimming history. Uh, so there's a little bit of subtlety there. Um, we don't have a lot of the original materials on display just because the exhibition has to be up for seven months. And so the idea of changing over paper-based collections after two to three months to um, prevent um, light damage. It's just too much work for our small team. Um, but we have got a couple of um, original materials in a case which we change over. But people do love to see the real thing, naturally. Um, I was very fortunate that I could use some of our budget to employ a professional 3D designer. In the past, I think council has used their in-house graphic designers who are fabulous at doing your newsletters and your flyers, but to ask them to think in 3D and that's a whole other world. Um, so I would highly recommend Ellen Thomas. She also ended up doing the design for the Pride Revolution at the State Library of New South Wales. But if you tell her that you're from a local council, she will charge you a slightly smaller fee. Don't tell them that, Ellen. <laughs> she, she does um, a good deal for local councils. She helped me immensely because, of course, with a lot of the reproductions, they can be almost any size you want them to be, but we had to make it look good. So she really helped me think through what size will everything be and how will the timeline work with the material. Um, so do involve locals who have a knowledge of the past, and we used social media to track down the people in these um, photographs that you see there. Mm. Um, so, yes, of course, our local history uh, documentation should have been able to tell us who donated the photographs and who was in the photographs, but no, no, not often no. So we were able to track them down using um, some of the local Facebook groups, you know, brought up in this part of the world, uh, which was really helpful. Um, we did put some items on the open display. So what you can see there is a ticket machine and then one of those, um, you know, very heavy plaques that um, go on the sides of buildings. So the plaque was on the side of the original swimming pool. So Ellen, the designer, designed a little thing that allowed it to um, kind of it's not quite leaning against the wall and it won't slip forward and it's indestructible for children. I, I just did not want anyone to pick it up and drop it on their toe. Um, the ticket machine still works and people have been taking the tickets out of it. So it was the machine that you got a little ticket when you paid your 20 cents to go onto the water slide. Um, all these old photographs of the building of the swimming pool in the 19, um, 1950s have been a big nostalgia trip for visitors to the exhibition um, who are adults and allowed them to talk about that with their children. So um, I love a bit of nostalgia and the colour photographs that you can see there are so 1980s. Um, the timeline helps us to break up the text. So it's like providing what in um, museum speak we call a text hierarchy so that people can go through the exhibition with but by dipping into the timeline, which is the third level of text, if they want to. Um, you might note that the, the lines in the timeline don't meet at the corners. I could have paid Ellen a lot more money to make them meet and for her to spend hours and hours making them meet up. We just decided it wasn't worth it and 
So far, no one's said anything to me. They might have noticed, but it's not that much of a big deal. We're, we're not the State Library. We are the Bayside Council Library. Um, the um, ephemera, as I said, has been um, very nostalgic for people. Um, we don't have a lot in our collection, but um, we, what we do have, um, it was wonderful to be able to put it on display. Uh, that's all original material. Um, we brought in some of the sun lounges from the actual pool. So that's been a lot of fun. Um, you can see two of the interactives there. I think I've got another photo of them. Yes. So this is just a whiteboard that I bought from Wink. Um, and then we got some photographs um, made on into magnets. Uh, and then the idea is that you have to match up the decade with the, the swimming costume. Um, something I learned is that people want the answer. I thought they kind of <laughs> get it, like, but no, they want the answer. So I had to then make an answer board and put that in a space in the exhibition and then amend the label to say where they could find the answer. So having the ability to amend the label, it was really important. Um, another thing I learned from the exhibition was that you, you've got to double check the printing quotes and what they promise they will do, what the printers promise they will do. So one of the problems is that we use an external printer who has a special deal with council, so I don't communicate with them directly. I communicate through a third party. And they promised that they would um, cut our umbrellas and our trees so that people could then stick them on this um, black and white photograph that you can see there with their memories of swimming at the pool, but they didn't. Uh, so they delivered them to us uncut because, of course, it costs a lot more for them to do the cutting. So we had to cut them out. So um, just check the quotes and check that they promise on what the brief is that you very clearly gave them. And I also, as a, a later edition, put in a visitor's book for comments. So we just got our graphic designers to make that up. Um, pretty much, you know, just pages with name, date. We wanted their age details if they wanted to give that to us, their email address if they wanted to give that to us, and their comments. Because we don't have um, a people counter on this space and we don't have any other way of gathering feedback from them apart from the memories that they write and then the comments that they write in the visitor's book. Um, uh, yes, so um, another learning. If you're using what's called um, self-adhesive vinyl, which is what makes the exhibition look so good. They will tell you to paint um, an undercoat on there, on your walls first, which we did. Don't use an oil-based undercoat. It has to be a water-based undercoat. Very important detail, which I didn't have before we started the installation. And so it peeled off overnight. And so we came in at 6.30 the next morning and went, oh my God, what are we gonna do? Uh, and it's very expensive. And you get one go to put it on and then it sticks on itself. So that was um, a disaster, uh, but problem solving and a lot of goodwill and we, we got back on track. Um, so water-based undercoat. Um, we did think about the younger audience. I had a lot of fun buying things for them to try on, um, water safety devices. So there's a whole sort of water safety message in there as well. And the idea is that uh, young children can put the floaties, which you can just see behind Bluey's ears there, onto Bluey. They fit on his arms to sort of, or they can try them on. Um, so here you see uh, Dorothy, who is our hero image um, in the exhibition um, in 1957 and in 2023. She was so stoked to be in the exhibition. I loved it. And these are some of the people who we tracked down um, who were in the black and white photographs that you saw before and our mayor in the middle. Um, so they were also really chuffed that they their photos are in the exhibition. Um, we have been monitoring how people use the space. So you can see the kids move the chairs around. That's fine. Um, stuff gets put around all over the place. That's fine from my point of view. And we've held story times in the exhibition space as well. Um, and I hope you'd like to come and see it. It's at Mascot Library. It's on until the end of July. It's only open library hours, but it's free. Um, we did have a bit of trouble using some of our photos on social media to try and promote the exhibition because 
Um, levels of nudity and acceptability have changed since the 1980s when these photos were taken and the Facebook bot told us that there was too much flesh. <laughs> Our account would be cancelled if we continue to post such terrible images. <laughs> uh, so um, that was really interesting as well. That's it from me, I think. For some reason with this next presentation, the all the Parramatta logos did not download through my email. So it's great, except for wherever there's a Parramatta logo, <laughs> um, which is terrible given actually it stopped all the pictures too. So uh -oh. there's a lot of pictures. It, it, it blocked it through my email. I'm sorry. Um, and I, I thought... USB, would that be your problem? How quickly can you get a USB? Thank you. That would be fun. <laughs> Sorry, technology is my friend today. <laughs> Should we do questions and comments on the flashback? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Until, um, until the next speaker gets back. Yes. Yeah, I wanted to ask Alison about that room, that exhibition space. So, is it all for that? What will you take that one down, or do other things happen? Uh, we have it, it is meant to be an exhibition space, so it has um, we're very lucky it's got proper track lighting and a hanging rack as well. Uh, I've got four movable walls, so I can make it smaller and big. I can't make it that much bigger, but I can make it smaller. Um, but we have used it as well for just you know study room, study tables, and chairs as well. Yeah. And sometimes it's both if it's just a um, a wall hung exhibition with the tables and chairs. Can you tell us what kind of budget you had? Yes, that is important. Um, so I probably spent about $10,000. So about half of that was Ellen's fee for the designer, which is incredibly reasonable. Um, and about half of it was printing because of the, the vinyl that you saw was quite expensive uh, and then printing all of the photographs as well. Yeah. And you said that you painted it. As well. So we just painted the walls a, a you know a standard neutral creamy color. Would you need to do it again? Uh, when we take off the vinyl, it depends how carefully we do it, <laughs> but because it can leave a residue on the walls. So um, we'll be doing it pretty slowly. Mm -hmm. uh, too short. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, particularly since I was going back to council records to to try to do, to build that timeline, like you keep reading all the council minutes. Um, so what was the timeline? Oh, and this was another learning. I'm not sure if I put that up there. We installed the week before Christmas. Because <laughs> I knew I couldn't get it done in January because everyone. So it was the week before Christmas, which you know I, I wanted to go on to Christmas, but did not want to hang over. Um, so the timeline was probably three months, which is. Um, not really enough. I had a comment about oh, sorry, John's not on. Oh, no, no. I was just going to um, talk about the digital preservation um, presentation because I actually think that there's a third category for digital preservation as well now. Because if you think about a physical object that you have, particularly acetate or nitrate based photographs or films, and I know we've got some really old films in our collection, and you digitize them, and now you've got the digital file. Very soon, it's not just a matter that we won't be able to read the acetate or nitrate, but it will no longer exist because it eats itself up if it's not in a stable environment. So it will not exist. So it's with the digital surrogate becomes the new original, which is another scary thing because it's there's no more. You can't re-digitize. That's fine. That's going to happen more, more and more. Yeah. So you say 
Um, just like that's quick show. That yeah. fits not you. Yeah. Yeah. They're not you. Um, yeah. it, just, it, it just adds to the okay. yeah. Let's see. I can view the canary and then I can transfer it back. What about how often you're asking? Yes. Do you do a practice run with our audience first? So we no. Yeah, we just, no. We just, no. 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 So, so the only kind of practice. As I started in tourism, <laughs> as I started in tourism um, as a young girl, I thought, why not go back to tourism? As long as my brain's okay, I can do things with tourism and, and uh, talks. Why not become a tour guide? So that's what I did. I went to TAFE. I studied. I became a tour guide. Uh, and then the study bug took me and I carried on with the diploma of tourism. So then I got the job at Parameter. Uh, I'm a member of the um, uh, Institute of Australian Tour Guides, uh, which also help you find tour guiding job, jobs if necessary. So normally if I do write a tour, what I start up with is the Aboriginal Acknowledgement. And it's not just written down, it's also in every tour I guide, I start with an acknowledgement. I'm sure you've done one, but I'll just repeat it again. Um, the local Indigenous people of the Parameter area are the Baramata Gaul. Bara meaning eel, mata water, gaul people. So where the Baramata Gaul found their supply of eels. This is the area we are working on today and talking on today. And I pay my respects to that of this past, present and emerging. And I also always like to privately thank them for sharing their knowledge with us today. Um, so this gets written into a, into a document. Then I look at the objective of the tour today. I've chosen the heritage walk with, within Parameter. What is the objective? To give an insight into the heritage of Parameter, our second settlement of Australia after Sydney, and to show people around the various different heritage places we have to offer. The key message to convey is, uh, firstly, that they are Aboriginal custodians have been in Parramatta for over 40,000 years, and we have got beautiful um, evidence of that. If you walk through Parramatta Square, take the time, because you, three, you can see three fire hearths um, plaques dating back 2,000 years, 700 years, but still into 1820s when the British had already arrived. Uh, and then it takes us into the British settlement and bring it, bringing it forward to the 21st century, um, we have the UNESCO World Heritage Parameter Park. And we also have um, we have re-engaged the meeting ground of the Baramata Gull, which is Parameter Square. So we're going into a, a 360 degree coming around for Aboriginals having used this space as a meeting place. And now we are meeting again here at Five. So then I look out and see who is my, tar uh, my targeted audience. So with a heritage tour, really it's a, a broad spectrum. So from um, primary school, year six, perhaps, uh, up until age seniors, uh, I can target anyone that comes into Parameter, be it local residents, be it international tourists, uh, be it um, uh, students, community groups, um, and workers. So that's what we've done in, in the past. Then the location is the CBD of Parameter. And then the time frame. So a good walking tour is two hours. Um, you can have them shortened, but then you can't give as much information as you would like. So start and finish, why you've got this big picture, start and finish. Start and finish is very important um, because you have to have a place to start your tour that is accessible to people and it is easily found by people. Uh, and Today, I'll guide you through this tour and I'll start at the Dara Circle, which is just below us in Parameter Square. And I normally like to finish on the high. So when I say high, I mean something that's pleasing to the eye, 
something that talks about parameter not in a negative way, something that people can actually leave the tour and go away happy and sit down and talk about it and hopefully have enjoyed it. So here we go. Are you ready for the, um, the tour of the pictures? Uh, so we start, uh, there are different points. First of all, I think about what do I want to show the people I'm guiding? So I start again with Derek and we've got this most beautiful Derek circle. I don't know if you've seen it yet. If not, please go outside as you walk out of five, turn to your right, and we've got this beautiful circle just below us with um, a lovely uh, Morton Bay fig trying to grow, hopefully very soon, into a nice shaded um, tree. So the, uh, the Derak circle is there to not only let the Derak sit down there, but anyone of the community can take a seat. And it's in the circle because it represents that we are all equal as people. And you sit in the circle and you talk at equal distance. And that's what I like about the Derek circle. So from there, we go into Centenary Square, which is a continuation of Parameter Square, but runs south to north. So Centenary Square, <coughs> excuse me, has got some quite um, beautiful um, heritage displays. One is Town Hall. I didn't take a picture of Town Hall because it's totally covered in hoarding. Mm -hmm. um, then we've got the two Murray Brothers buildings. Um, Murray Brothers were like the David Jones in, in their days. One brother had uh, anything from clothes, christening gowns to pianolas, and the other one was the bunning side of Murray Brothers in its heyday. Um, another thing on Centenary Square is the beautiful Centenary uh, clock, uh, which is still working today, and it also was a water fountain. So there's plenty to talk about there. Then we move along to um, St John's Cathedral, which you actually can see from here. You can see the beautiful spires. So again, there's quite a bit to, to tell about, but I normally keep it succinct. I wouldn't talk more than three minutes about one stop unless I get questions because otherwise people switch off. It's, it's uh, information overload. So from St. John's, um, at St. John's, I would perhaps put a little quote in from, not so much a quote, but a little anecdote about um, Lady Macquarie, because she was the instigator to have the two towers built. So she made the Governor Macquarie build me uh, a church that looks like uh, the church in Reculver, Kent, and he obliged and he gave it to the, the two towers. Then I'm not sure if you've heard about the Philip Ruddock Heritage Centre. Um, if your time allows while you're here at Parameter, please go and see it. It's the most beautiful archaeological display, um, one of two in Parameter. And um, it's about five minutes from here. It's open to the public in the mornings and in the afternoons. However, if I were to guide a tour and take them within the centre, I would actually ring up and make an appointment saying, I've got a group of 20 coming through, would you please open for us or keep it open for us? From there, we go on to Parameter Park, which is a UNESCO World Heritage listed site. It was um, put onto the World Heritage listed listing in 2010. And within Parameter Park, we have two, uh, two of 11 convict sites which are inscribed on the World Heritage Listing. And one of them is Old Government House. Old Government House, again, is um, legacy of Governor Macquarie and his good Mrs. Um, Lady Macquarie. And you can take tours. They hold tours either for groups of people or you just walk in, you have uh, volunteers in there and they guide you through the house. We exit the park at one of the six gatehouses in Parramatta. This one is uh, the George Street Gatehouse, also referred to as the Tudor Gatehouse. Um, and as I mentioned, there's six around um, all the area. This one is uh, special because it was uh, renovated not so long ago, and it was actually created by a Parramatta architect called McKinnon. From there we go, this is one of my favorite places, to Brislington. 
uh, which is now a nursing museum, but in, in the olden days, it used to be the home of the nurses that actually worked in the Parameta District Hospital. Uh, and it was built by an ex-convict who won an enormous amount of money, a thousand pounds in gold at a card game. <laughs> and if, please go and, if, you, if your time allows while you're here, go and see these places because they're wonderful. So in the back, on the back wall, he actually put in brick the suit of the hand he won with. And I'm not going to tell you because I want you to refer to Emma and tell her the answer. So he, he won this gold, uh, this gold and then he approached Governor Macquarie to, um, to get a liquor licence. And in those days, in order to get a liquor licence, you also had to build something substantial. And he built this house without the veranda that was a later addition. However, he's an ex-convict. Um, he got um, found out that he was stealing government property, a mortuary slab, all sorts of things, and he had to sell the house. And then over years, um, the next um, person that went into the, was Dr. Brown, and we had three Drs. Brown in residence there being doctors for the parameter. Um, community. And today, as I said, it's a nursing museum, a wonderful place to visit. Then the next archaeological site would be the colonial hospital site. Um, the picture you're looking at on your left is the, uh, the remnants of the original foundation of the colonial hospital. And the bricks are quite interesting because they've got the convict arrows still on it, some of them. I normally let my participants try and find one or two of them. And on the right-hand side, the picture on the right-hand side are beautiful uh, peppercorn trees. And the nurses had a local, uh, not a local, the, had a monthly newsletter, which they called the peppercorn. Hence, uh, we've got the peppercorn trees there. So from there, we go past King School. King School um, was one of the first private schools that was established in the 1830s. Uh, and in the mid 1900s, King School actually moved from Parameta up to Pennant Hills Road, and they're still up there, very prestigious uh, boys' um, private school. And this beautiful old building then uh, sat dormant for a while, then the Department of Envir Environment and Heritage moved in. And then uh, the Parameda Pro uh, Primary School needed a new home for the students because their school was being demolished and replaced. So um, King School was upgraded, modernized, the children moved in there. Once their school was finished uh, at the southern end of Parameda, the children moved back into their new school and this became the new Bayanami Primary School. And Bayanami is a direct word for learning. So it's been reinvented. Uh, from there we go into Prince Alfred Square, named after Prince Alfred, um, son of uh, Queen Victoria. And this place is the most beautiful place to visit. It has very rich um, heritage background because it was the, the place of the first and second parameter jail, but also the place of the first female factory. And then at this side, I would bring another personal story into it uh, about Dr. Anderson, uh, who was a local doctor, and together with James Pye, they organised and uh, instigated that uh, Parameda gets its own local uh, water supply, uh, which was made, um, which was done then in the, was built in the mid 1850s. We have Parameda Lake with beautiful uh, dammed area, and that used to be the water supply for Parameda for many years. However, the water didn't run into Parameta until about 1880s, so it took some time. But the beauty of it is that when Dr. Anderson, before he passed away, he left a legacy, he left some the pounds, and he established seven drinking fountains within the Parameta area for the children. And one of those fountains is still sitting in Prince Alfred Square. Uh, so two more stops. Uh, you can't go visiting Parameta unless you see. Lennox Bridge. So it was built between 1836 and 1839 by no other than David Lennox. Um, and the 
the side you're looking at is the eastern side and it's the original sandstone. On the western side, because the bridge was extended in the uh, early 1900s, we've got a sandstone facade, but it's not original. And it's also got portals now. The northern portal is open and now it actually let, lets you walk or ride your bicycle all the way from Parramatta Park into um, Sydney Olympic Park and beyond if you wanted to. And then I would finish um, on the Parramatta River because it's a very tranquil area. It has got a lot of um, wildlife there in terms of birds. Um, I've been lucky enough to see eels in there, so that's very exciting because I know they are still around. Um, and I would finish then off again with Darug, that they used to live here and use this river as a mode of transport. It gave them the fresh water. It gave them uh, freshwater fish and saltwater fish because the Parramatta River becomes brackish and saltwater as you go towards the city. Um, and I would finish off the tour that way. So this is roughly about two hours, give or take one stop. So what you need to do next is Sorry. Uh, what you do, need to do next is do a reconnaissance. So you, you start at the first stop and you time yourself and you see how long it takes you to go from first stop to second stop, second to third, and you run it through. And then uh, I might have said this before, I allow about three to four minutes per stop. Sometimes you might go over. In other places, you go less. And that would then give you the, to the total time frame of the tour. Um, the next thing you need to do is the risk assessment. So that's um, quite tedious, but it needs to be done. So first, I would start with the office task assessment first. What can happen to me while I'm writing the tour at the office? So what comes to mind is falling over cables, tripping over things. Um, electrocution in case you put your finger in a, a PowerPoint. It's simple things, but it's happened. Um, the next one is COVID-19. We had to upgrade all our risk assessments with COVID-19. I don't have to say in, anymore. Noise levels along the way, slip hazards along the way. So there's there are quite a number uh, with the beautiful um, liquid ambers we've got. They're quite a nightmare. In, uh, I think the time is coming up now when they drop their seeds and it's a slip hazard. So it's got to be written down and I always spruik it to my participants. Beware as we walk through. Allergies, the weather, and then, of course, people movements. If you've got a group of 20 people, um, you always have to tell them to move in one lot because it's happened to me before you go across the intersections and you always have the left, leftover ones and then they <laughs> slow and then they get cut off and you're losing three or four minutes and then it's your time frame gone out. Um, so, yes, try and get the people across in one, in one bit. And then the other thing is the toolkit. So toolkit, uh, what do I need to bring? I've got to have my mobile phone in case I have to ring someone if someone falls over. Definitely, if I have, uh, I need an ambulance, things like that. I need my key contacts within my mobile phone. Who will I ring? Uh, police, ambulance, things like that. Um, first aid kit we have on hand. Um, so that's just a given. My satchel's got the first aid kit in it. I go to it. I've got it ready to go. Um, and then the feedback forms, we've gone online now. Um, in the olden days, we had printout ones, which to me are quicker and I prefer them because I get the participants to give me feedback as they finish off. And if I send out an, a link to a survey, that could take them three days to respond. And in three days, you might lose some of the tour content and you might have different ideas about it. Uh, so I rather catch them as I can. Uh, and see how happy everyone is. And, and I love feedback, positive or negative, because you learn out of it. You can see what happens. Promotions, well, 
Yes. <laughs> We've got a digital department within the city of Parramatta, so it's easier for us now to approach the digital department. When we were in our old place up at the Heritage and Visitor Information Centre, it was a bit of a struggle because we we're always kept separately from the, the core of city of Parramatta. It's easier now. We used to do flyers and I still like to get flyers out because there's a certain demographic of participants that like something in their hands. But uh, because we are reducing on paper consumption, so flies are a bit critical at the moment. Um, Cross-promoting, of course, yes, with uh, Parameter Park, uh, Philip Ruddock Heritage Centre comes to mind and other heritage places. Uh, then we used to advertise on Destination New South Wales, and I'm still advocating for that now, because we've just had a big change in staff, so we are reinventing ourselves. Um, I always find local newspapers very good because, again, 55 pluses like their newspapers and they go towards it. Um, advertising to social clubs and community hubs, uh, like our library here, but I also like to reach out to Rotary clubs and um, senior citizen clubs, uh, Provis clubs, uh, because they are the citizens that have time to ensure a tour. And then, of course, you need a booking agent. Uh, and in the past, we had Eventbrite, which is if you were to start up as your own tour guide, you could use Eventbrite without paying. Um, and now at uh, City of Parramatta Council, we are using Bookable uh, for all our items, um, even Riverside Theatre. So we've come to the end. I hope. You, joy, joy, um, you enjoyed this little tour. I'm opening up for uh, questions. Have I got a couple more minutes? Thank you. We do on some, we don't. <laughs>